Oh, maybe it is. All right. Well, I'm I'm want to like go off on tangents, so I made sure I type something up, so I'll read it directly and not not veer from my spoken word. Um, welcome, the FCC Office of Communications Business Opportunities, Media Bureau, and the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group of the Advisory Committee on Diversity and Digital Empowerment. Welcome you to our Supplier Diversity Workshop. My name is Sanford Williams, and I am the director of the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, and it is my pleasure to say a few words about our next speaker. Chairman Pai. And there's no pressure because he's my boss, so, but you know, I'll try, I'll try to relax. Um, Ajit Pai joined the Federal Communications Commission as a commissioner in 2012 and was named the chairman of the FCC in January 2017. The son of immigrants from India, Chairman Pai is the first Asian American to head the agency. During his tenure, Chairman Pai's top priority has been to close the digital divide and connect all Americans, regardless of race, gender, religion, or sexual orientation with digital opportunity. Consistent with that objective, Chairman Pai last year formed a new federal advisory committee, the Advisory Committee on Diversity and Digital Empowerment, to provide advice and recommendations to the commission regarding how to empower disadvantaged communities and accelerate the entry of small businesses, including those owned by women and minorities, into the media, digital news, and information and audio and video programming industries. The committee held its first meeting on September 25, 2017, and one of its recommendations was that it work with the FCC to hold a workshop on supplier diversity, hence our presence here today. I thank Chairman Pai for his vision and for his support of the committee and for this workshop. Please welcome Chairman Pai. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Sanford, and uh, good morning uh, to all of you. I should uh, start by saying uh, I hope you had a great weekend, and I apologize for being a little bit late. Uh, misjudged the time uh, that I was supposed to be here. I think if we learned anything from game one of the NBA Finals, like, you need to know the score. Uh, <laughs> anyway, here on, uh, I will be on time. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to welcome everyone to the FCC. It's impressive to see everybody who is here in attendance. Uh, when it comes to diversity in the communications marketplace, we know that we still have some work to do to catch up, but judging from the talent I see in this room, I think it's pretty clear uh, that we are on the right track. Uh, speaking of team sports, uh, putting together today's event has truly been a team effort, and so I want to thank everyone who made it possible. In particular, we have three co-sponsors, the FCC's Office of Communications Business Opportunities, or OCBO, our Media Bureau, and the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group of our Advisory Committee on Diversity in digital empowerment. And I want to thank the leaders of each of our co-sponsors, uh, Sanford Williams of OCBO, uh, Michelle Carey, who I think might be here, uh, from the Media Bureau, and Heather Gate, uh, who is chairing the Working Group's Access Subcommittee. An additional thank you to the members of each of their respective teams. If I thanked everybody by name uh, who worked to pull off this event, of course, I'd use up all my allotted time. Uh, but just please do know how much I appreciate how much work went into organizing this event, and I'm grateful to everyone who is here and those who contributed but couldn't be here uh, who will help make it happen. Also, given their extraordinary efforts as the FCC's lead staffers for the D Diversity Advisory Committee, I have to commend uh, Jamila Beth Johnson and Brenda Villanueva, who have done a tremendous job. And with your indulgence, if you wouldn't mind giving them a hand, because they really do a lot of great work. Uh, finally, thank you to all of our panelists here for uh, volunteering your time to be here today. Today's event is only possible because of your participation in these discussions and one-on-one -on -one consultations, so thank you for that. Uh, we have a remarkable turnout from industry, and I think it's for good reason. You get to interact with entrepreneurs who can deliver value for you and who have been historically underrepresented in the communications space. Uh, this is a classic example of being able to do well by doing good. Uh, today's Supplier Diversity Workshop is also personally gratifying for me and allow me to give you a minute to explain. Last year, I announced that we were going to be reestablishing our Diversity Advisory Committee after it had been disbanded years earlier. This past September, the committee met for the first time, and at that meeting, I delivered opening remarks, much as I am now. Uh, one of my key messages was that the aim of this committee was not a lot of talk, important though talk is. We wanted action, and we expected tangible results. Today's event is one of those tangible results. 
The committee held its second meeting this past March, and one of the recommendations was to conduct a supplier diversity workshop. You took that recommendation and you made it happen. And you made it happen fast, in three and a half months or so. It takes a lot of busy people, a lot of time and effort to put together such a comprehensive workshop so quickly, but you did that. And so my main message to you this morning would be that now that I can see what you're able to do, I'm adjusting my expectations and raising the bar even higher. I'm going to expect the committee to work with FCC staff to make more real world connections for small businesses, including those owned by women and minorities. I'm going to expect more recommendations on policies and best practices. I'm going to expect recommendations on how to bring more diversity to Silicon Valley. And last, I fully expect that you will exceed my expectations and that collectively we will increase diversity throughout the communications industry and expand digital opportunity to more Americans. Uh, thanks again to everybody who got us here and who will continue to take us forward. I hope you have a great day. And to those who I didn't have a chance to say hello to before uh, this event started, once again, thank you for being here. It really means a lot to see the talent in this room. And I can't wait to see the work that is produced as a result of your labors. Thanks again for the indulgence. <laughs>
When people root for their favorite teams or enjoy a great movie or music or work of art, they don't generally care about the economic status, the ethnicity, the color, the gender, or the orientation of those they cheer for. So why are we as a society still significantly affected by these factors when it comes to business, education, and many other areas? There are a variety of systemic and individualized nuances that contribute to this problem. But I think it is our duty as a community to address these issues to the best of our abilities. If we are truly going to live up to ideals of our nation, we must be intentional and constantly strive to create equal opportunity and equal access for all. I hope this workshop is part of that process. Thank you for your time. And next is Heather Gate, Chair of the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group. Again, thank you, Chairman Pai. We accept the challenge to <laughs> continue to work on behalf of my committee, and they may have something to say about it, but I accept the challenge. Thank you, Chairman Pai, FCC staff, staff members, members of the Advisory Committee on Diversity and Digital Empowerment, to all the small businesses, uh, industry leaders, supply diversity program managers, and panelists. Welcome to our supply diversity workshop. As a member of the advisory committee, I am very pleased to be here. Uh, my name again is Heather Gate. I am the director of digital inclusion at Connected Nation. The advisory committee on diversity and digital empowerment was commissioned by Chairman Pai last year with the mission of making recommendations to the commission on how we can empower disadvantaged communities and accelerate the entry of small businesses, including those businesses owned by women, minorities, and other diverse populations into the media, telecommunications, and other tech industries as owners, suppliers, and employees. Our working group was also charged with providing recommendations to the commission on how we can ensure disadvantaged communities are not denied a wide range of opportunities made possible by next generation networks. So today, as a member of the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group, we are honored to be partnering with Sanford and his Office of Communication Business Opportunities and the FCC's uh, Media Bureau to help put together the agenda for, for today's workshop. This all came together for us a few months ago when we as a working group began putting together our action plan. Among other outlined objectives in our action plan, we had consensus that supplier diversity was an area that we needed to focus on. We felt that the current discussions around infrastructure at a federal level and the massive investments planned by network providers, it was essential for us to explore ways that we could ensure participations by small businesses and diverse, diverse uh, suppliers. We would do this by putting together this workshop, which will, present, which will present an opportunity to bring awareness to increased procurement opportunities that resulted in these, that result from these uh, discussions. So again, when the opportunity arose for us to partner with ACBO and the Media Bureau, we were glad to answer this call. And we were glad that our full committee voted to approve this plan. So to the entrepreneurs that are here today, we hope that you leave today with new insights on how to successfully na navigate corporate supply diversity programs, how to work with corporate procurement offices and that you garner new information on the requirements for certification and licensure from our experienced panelists. We want you to leave here having gained leads on new contracting opportunities that can lead to your sustained growth and investment in diverse communities. A couple of months ago, CVM Solutions, a global provider of supplier data, supplier data and solutions published a couple of reports that showed the results of a supply diversity survey as a reflection of the state of supply diversity in 2018. 
When looking at the key challenges faced by diverse suppliers, they found frustration. And some of the reasons were for these frustrations were the inability to be noticed, poor communications between diverse supplier programs and suppliers. Well, I, I hope that together today we can help to alleviate, we can begin to help to alleviate some of those frustrations, even in a small way. We will have done our job for today. We know that when diverse suppliers win, we all win. The economy wins, job searches win, diverse and disadvantaged communities win. Companies that run good supplier diversity programs win. The economic impact of diverse suppliers is well documented by various agencies, including the National Minority Supplier Development Council, Council that sanctioned a study of the impact of minority businesses and found an economic impact of over $400 billion and over 2.2 million jobs created and preserved. As far as return on investment for companies that have su strong supply diversity programs, a study conducted by the Hackett Group that's based out of Atlanta found that those companies that, those companies that had great programs generated over 100% greater procurement return on investment on, from similar companies, driving an additional $3.6 billion to their company's bottom line we can go on and on about the benefits of supplier diversity, including the fact that it helps to increase innovation, it helps to expose uh, industry to new markets, uh, it helps dig uh, disadvantaged communities. So for us as a working group and members of the Commission's Advisory Committee, our work will not end with this workshop, definitely not. This is a beginning for us in helping to reinforce the importance of diverse suppliers and ultimately make recommendations to the FCC on continuing to use the Commission's bully pulpit to cover issues experienced by supplier diversity, by, by, uh, by, by diverse suppliers, and to work on addressing what the benefits of having them are. In conclusion, I would like to recognize all the OCBO and Media Brew staff members who have for the grant of getting this event together. Thank you, Sanford, and thanks to your team and the Media Bureau. I would like to work to thank uh, my working group members who from day one have shown, shown a true commitment to helping move the needle on this important matter. So um, I won't, I, would you raise your hand if you're a member of the, our working group so you can be recognized? Thank you. And I would like to echo the chairman's um, recognition of our designated federal officer, Jamila Bethel Johnson and Brenda Villanova. Thank you for your guidance and helping to keep us in line. <laughs> um, thank you to the panelists who heeded to our call and agreed to spend the day with us on this very important um, engagement with small businesses. And thank you to all the small businesses. We appreciate the contributions that you make to this country. We appreciate the contributions that you continue to make every day. And we also appreciate the struggles that you encounter. Uh, so for now, I'm going to wrap up and please feel free to share your reactions via social media. Uh, Sanford sh shared the hashtag uh, FCC Live and FCC Supplier Diversity. The, your input and your feedback is very valuable to us as we continue to um, consider what our recommendations will be for supplier diversity at the end of our tenure. So thank you, everybody, and I hope we have a good day today of learning. Thank you. And next is Rudy Brioche. Thank you very much, Stanford, and uh, Heather, thank you very much for, I think, a really set of wise comments for us all to heed uh, throughout the day. 
Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the 2018 Supplier Diversity Workshop. And congratulations to Stanford and his team, and his very committed team here at the FCC for tirelessly working to put this effort into reality. Organizing an, an event like this for businesses to come together to talk about how they could connect, how they could actually develop innovative businesses, products, and to more importantly develop some form of economic basis for broader diverse communities throughout the United States is an important and a compelling interest for the United States. And compliments to the chairman for recognizing that diversity is an essential part of this communication technology industry. At Comcast, we take it very seriously. Each year, many companies like Comcast and other companies who are seated here as part of the first panel, recognizing that being part of a diverse community and searching for diverse suppliers makes good business sense. It brings value to our business. It allows us to partner with innovative business leaders. It allows us to expand business opportunities for diverse owned businesses. So through all these outreach efforts, these outreach efforts allows us to build our capacity as a business and to grow su supplier diversity pipeline. The pipeline is extremely important because not only is it important for us to engage with the businesses of today, the question is can we also develop a process for us to help develop diverse businesses in the future as well. At Comcast, we believe that based on our learnings that diverse suppliers bring value to the company, not just through their service offerings, but also by creating opportunities for economic growth in diverse communities throughout the United States. Building these partnerships with diverse suppliers help us address the company's evolving needs and also contribute to the economic growth and job creation of a wide array of communities throughout the United States, whether it's women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, LGBT, veterans. We believe that diversity doesn't stop uh, at any single place. Diversity requires us to search out in all corners of the globe. So since 2010, Comcast NBC Universal has spent over $16 billion in diverse tier one and tier two suppliers. And in 2017 alone, we spent more than $4 billion with diverse vendors and subcontractors. In an effort to build our capacity and to accelerate the growth of diverse owned businesses, we've developed and customized accelerator programs to help potential partners learn about our business and and uh, to grow. And in so doing, that helps those same businesses interact with other communication and technology companies like the ones we have here on the first panel, and many others as well. And later today, we have the one-on-one -on -one consultation periods. It's a time when we could actually engage and have a chance to start to develop these relationships. So on behalf of the subcommittee, the access subcommittee of the FCC Diversity um, Committee. Welcome to the 2018 Supply Diversity Workshop. It's important for us to develop networks, for us to connect with each other, for us to develop meaningful contacts, and for us to develop, grow, sustaining business relationships. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rudy. We're going to flow right into our first panel with Dr. Ron Johnson. Dr. Johnson, take it away. So good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, good morning to our visitors and guests and to the staff here at FCC and to all of our panelists who've joined with me today to talk about a very important topic. I know it's important because you're here, and I know it's important because the FCC decided to stand up this event today. So thank you, Director Williams, for your remarks uh, and for your support and the support of your team uh, in putting this very important and timely event together today. Uh, thanks to Heather and to Rudy for their remarks and their support of these activities and all of the things they do to make diversity and inclusion a part of our everyday uh, way of living. 
Uh, as we, we all know, consumer appetite for faster and more reliable and more expansive services has progressed to unforeseen levels in the last few years. The insatiable appetite continues to challenge service providers to maintain pace with this great demand that consumers have. And nowhere is this more evident than in the advent of 5G and the consumer's anticipation and desire for services of convenience, services that heretofore were not available to them, uh, and certainly will make life um, as consumers much, much better for all of us and for all of them. So as we look at research and design engineering and disification and infrastructure build out in OSS, uh, all of these offer unprecedented opportunities for businesses, small and large businesses across the landscape. And so enormous dollars have been committed, CapEx expenditures in particular, for, um, for how to unravel and support the development of 5G and other uh, new uh, technologies that are coming online. And all of these dollars will add great opportunity for small and large businesses to participate. And so today we would talk, like to talk about uh, if there are uh, opportunities for small and diverse businesses to participate, we want to be certain that there are few, if any, um, impediments and that all of these businesses will have an unfettered opportunity to participate, to compete, and more importantly, to win opportunities with, with my, uh, my panelists today. And I'm sure they have uh, great history in providing opportunities for diverse businesses, and we're going to explore more of those today. So it is a great honor for me to moderate um, this fireside chat with four of my, my friends here, and we're going to allow you guys and ladies to kind of listen in on this personal chat I'm going to have with them. And we'll allow for you later to have questions. If you would give your questions to Sanford or someone on his team, um, I will then raise those questions with, with, my, with my colleagues. So, uh, to my immediate left, uh, Megan Rast is with um, Charter Communications. You all know her. Uh, Chi Pak is with T-Mobile, Pat Patterson with Verizon, uh, and Yvette Mouton with uh, AT&T. So please join me now in thanking our panelists for being here today. So, so this, this brief chat, uh, we have about, I think, 45 minutes, will center around procurement opportunities for diverse suppliers. Uh, and in doing so, we will explore four of the most impactful aspects of procurement best practices um, in diversity and inclusion. Number one, how companies define supplier diversity and the requirements suppliers must meet to conduct business with these companies and with others. Number two, the commitment of large companies to the search for diverse suppliers uh, and how to get um, contracts awarded to them and to identify the opportunities uh, for them. And number three, a commitment from senior executives and sourcing representatives from these organizations uh, that, uh, so that they will identify the impact of future infrastructure investments on the supplier market and to be certain that diverse suppliers are included in that total process of identifying opportunities, competing for opportunities, and in the final analysis to win uh, these new opportunities. And then prescriptively, number four and last, and prescriptively, their views of how diverse suppliers should navigate the competitive procurement process to secure business opportunities uh, from their prospective companies. And so I would like to start this out with asking uh, if they would like to have some opening remarks, starting to my immediate uh, right with Charter, or Megan Rest, um, up to no, let, no more than two minutes, if you would like to have some comments for our audience, please. Uh, sure, I'll, <clears throat> I'll keep it briefer than two minutes. Uh, my name is Megan Rast. I'm the Senior Manager of Supplier Diversity at Charter Communications. I'm really excited to be here at Charter. Uh, with our merger acquisition two years ago, made a very large commitment to diversity and inclusion. I started at the company a year and a half ago, and, and we've been doing a lot with our supplier diversity program. So excited as the questions go along to give you more insights into what we've built. Good afternoon, Chi Pak with uh, T-Mobile, Supplier Diversity Senior Manager. Um, been with the company almost uh, 12 years in total. I serve on our NMSDC uh, Regional Council. Um, as a board member, uh, I'm excited about today. Looking forward to, as uh, Chairman Pai mentioned, not just the talk, but how do we get some tangible action from this, and I hope to impart some of my experience that we've had and show T-Mobile's overall commitment to supplier diversity and diversity inclusion as a whole. Um, so excited about the day, thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. I'm Pat Patterson from Verizon, uh, Manager of Supplier Diversity. It's a pleasure to be here this morning with everyone. Uh, I look forward to sharing and also learning from, from some of you and also some of my panelists here as well, some of my peers in this industry. Um, it, at Verizon, uh, we take this very, very seriously. Uh, we start at the top with our CEO, Lowell McAdam. Uh, he's personally involved with it, and uh, it goes all the way down. So uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Come on, let's get some energy. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> All right. All right well, yeah. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to participate in today's FCC Supply Diversity Workshop panel. And we're also excited about the matchmaking sessions this afternoon. And in keeping with the sports analogy, we want you to bring your A game and hit me with your best shot when I meet with you this <laughs> afternoon. In fact, AT&T, we're doing 16 sessions. My colleague and I, Stephanie Bates, will be doing 16 matchmaking sessions. So this is a really special year for AT&T because we are celebrating our 50th our 50th anniversary in supplier diversity. In 1968, since 1968 rather, AT&T has spent approximately $158 billion with minority women, service disabled, and LGBT businesses, which helped to spur a legion of new businesses in commercials, um, com communications, and technology rather. We have been in the forefront to help launch diversity business organizations and providing resources for the ecosystem and supports diverse businesses' success. We continue to support supplier diversity at AT&T because for over 50 years, we have recognized and demonstrated that it actually makes us a stronger company. But most importantly, we're looking forward to 50 more years of new progressive initiatives to continue our role as a leader in the supplier diversity industry. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So it has been said, um, particularly from folks like myself who are engaged in diversity and inclusion from an academic perspective, is that uh, it's often like a special event. It's like a big dance. So diversity gets you invited to the party, but inclusion asks you to dance. You, you get invited, but then you have to dance once you get to the party. And so I'd like to follow up with the comments that you made, uh, Yvette, about uh, AT&T's new diversity program vision. Um, you guys have done wonderful things in the past, but let's hear about some of your new visions that you're working on right now. Well, thank you. Um, that's a great question because we are so excited to announce our stellar supplier diversity program vision. Our new program consists of three pillars, supplier diversity and inclusion performance, education, business, and fostering programs, and investing in educational foundries. Our new vision is in the formulative stages. However, the takeaway is that AT&T's outcomes will go well beyond our spend with diverse suppliers. Indeed, our state-of-the-art vision will include meaningful and measurable impacts on both diverse suppliers, suppliers rather, and communities. The first wave of the future will be diversity, diversity and inclusion. We will purposely collaborate with prime suppliers to track and address the makeup of their workforce diversity and inclusion and their diversity programs that impact diverse communities. Second, we will focus on education and business fostering to enable diverse entities to garner more work. AT&T will work with private equity firms and our prime suppliers to create enhanced opportunities. Specifically, we're gonna be looking at barriers to entry such as access to capital. Furthermore, we will revisit AT&T's diverse suppliers criteria. We're going to look at our RFP requirements for diverse spend and other factors that will enhance our supplier diversity program. And third, we're going to invest in educational foundries to build diverse businesses from the ground up in new growth areas. Hmm. Thank you. Oh, yes. Well, those are very impactful things that you're doing. And I'm curious as to whether or not your three colleagues are doing similar things. I know all of you all have very progressive programs at your organization. So um, just in the notion of fair time, would you all like to speak to anything innovative that you're doing that you want to share right now with us? Anyone can, or, or no one, anyone would like to share anything? Um, sure. Um, I'll share some things. Um, okay. One of the things that we've kicked off, um, and I, I may be jumping ahead a little bit, but, but that's okay. Um, one of the things that we've kicked off uh, earlier this year is a, is a program called EDGE, which is Educate, Develop, Grow, and Enrich. And that's a program that we started as a, peer, as a, as a key um, mentoring program for diverse suppliers within Verizon uh, that we partner with currently. 
Uh, in addition to that, what, what, part, what that makes up is it aligns some of our current diverse suppliers with key executive leaders within Verizon. So many times you may have uh, mentoring that are done by some of the supply diversity folks. You may have some done by uh, you know, directors, senior managers, and, and things and, so, and such. The, this program aligns vice presidents to senior vice presidents directly with the CEOs and leaders of these diverse businesses that, that we currently partner with. So far, we've seen a lot of success with this. So we're planning to, sec to roll out a second phase later this year. The first phase, we had six suppliers as part of that program. This phase, we're looking to add a lot more. Uh, in addition to that, we also have what we call Premier Supplier Academy. Now, this is for diverse suppliers that are not currently doing business with Verizon, but we're involving and introducing to the key business leaders within Verizon for procurement opportunities. Mm -hmm. So those are a couple of things that we're doing um, yeah. right now. But those are two great visions. Uh, Chi and Megan, anything you'd like to share with us on those points? So, so for T-Mobile, I think, um, Last, earlier this year, I, t I spoke at the MMTC, right. and I talked about timing as, as a critical portion of when do suppliers get onboarded or not. Um, organizational structures impact those decisions as well. And so for T-Mobile, I think part of some of just the best-in-class procurement organizations are consolidated, they're centralized, and there's a single leadership in that decision-making process. So I report directly to our senior vice president of procurement. Um, he's accountable for all of the procurement decisions. He has the forecast roadmap for the 5G build-out network technology. Um, and I think going back to the whole tangible action rather than just talk is um, he's incented. He's, his bonus is based on supplier diversity goals and spend. And so for me, that just shows the level of commitment, not only just from our CEO, but to the senior leadership that is accountable for this, that let's put this to action and not just talk with it. And so um, like him, I'm, I'm measured on it as well too. So anytime you mess with people's money, they're gonna be properly motivated, I believe, so. I think so, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, well said. Megan? So as a relatively newer program, I, I, I think it, we recognize the importance of investing in developing diverse suppliers because that's a really key component of their ability to compete. And so even in year one, uh, the tech executive education at Dartmouth has a really um, top-notch program for diverse suppliers. So even in year one, we invested in uh, scholarships and, the, and internally, and this speaks to kind of the charter culture, uh, our business units were actually the ones to nominate diverse suppliers. So at the, in year one, we just kind of invested in our existing diverse suppliers to help them grow and be able to compete better. Uh, but it's a sign, right, that our, our, back to the comment around stakeholders, right, you know, whenever you have the decision makers inside a company like Charter uh, being the ones to identify these diverse suppliers who have high potential for growth and then investing in their development, um, that sort of uh, is our, at the moment, program that we're excited to, to have accomplished in 2017. Well, that's great. And uh, thank you, Yvette, for kind of kicking off that discussion. So now we know what your colleagues are doing, too, and certainly our our uh, students out here in the audience have gained some knowledge about what they're doing as well. So thank you for kicking that off. So Megan, let's circle back to you. Um, you and I had some conversation about how your company prioritizes across the enterprise, this whole notion of diversity and conclusion. So can you talk a little bit about how you've been able to do that, prioritizing? Yeah, yeah I'm very excited to talk about it because I think it's it's, I guess today's an opportunity to kind of go under the hood a little bit of things that are happening internally at Charter that aren't always quite as visible. So I mentioned at the time of our merger acquisition two years ago, we made a large commitment. Um, that's a memorandum of understanding. It's publicly available. Um, it was sort of our starting point with diversity and inclusion. Uh, certainly I'm here today because I represent uh, the supplier diversity program. Uh, it had bigger commitments than procurement. It also included workforce, philanthropy, and programming commitments mm -hmm. for diversity inclusion. Uh, but what I think has been uh, exciting to see within Charter is the level of commitment, the governance that went along with that. So um, we have a chief diversity officer who started after that MOU. Certainly I started after that MOU. Uh, but really from a governance standpoint, uh, we have two uh, councils or committees. One is an external diversity and inclusion council. So a lot of the signatories of that MOU are actually advising us as a company for how to 
not only implement but also progress and, and continue you know, investing in that commitment. Uh, we also have not required in our MOU but just a really good best practice, um, an executive steering committee for diversity and inclusion. So supplier diversity is one of the aspects that reports on, uh, into that. It's chaired by our CEO. It has all of uh, his direct reports, so all of the heads of every business unit. And they're the ones who have the responsibility and accountability, meaning specifically for supplier diversity, they're the ones responsible and accountable for a supplier diversity goal or a spend goal. So um, why is that important, right? As a diverse supplier, I think you'd really want to make sure that our companies like us you know, aren't bifurcating the, the accountability of a goal from the decision maker, right? So when you have um, all of our, our heads of business units engaged in the program, engaged in the goal setting, responsible for that goal setting. I know my, my uh, peer, Chi, mentioned, you know, when, when rubber hits the road, right, when you have a, when you see that gap, it really inspires action. Um, and so while we're in process, we're, you know, a relatively new program, I think we've been doing a lot to invest in building it out in the right way and building it out in a way that is integrated into the way that we operate, so. So the issue of enterprise governance is certainly really important, and, I, and thanks for sharing those comments with us. But I would like for the other panelists to talk about the structure in your organization. Do you have a similar, I know you have a similar commitment, but can you talk briefly about how your unit uh, interrelates to the other units in your organization? Um, Chi, you want to talk about T-Mobile yes. right quick? Yeah, okay. so I think um, for T-Mobile, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, um, and supplier diversity is part of that in terms of the golden thread of what it stands for, I think it's, we have to look at it from a holistic eco connection between it. Um, our CEO um, launched uh, an amazing program for veterans, and mm -hmm. so those that are served, thank you for that. Um, you get 50% off for the rest of your life, and so that's our, our little way to say thank you. It goes back to the Super Bowl ad of our little ones, if anybody saw the Super Bowl, that little commercial. Um, and, and, and I bring all this up because it's not just a uh, segregated silo of supplier diversity, DNI, and then the uh, different component of what we stand for as a company, but it's just part of our overall makeup because we recognize that at T-Mobile, our customers are the most diverse among the carriers, and we have we understand that in order to serve them, which is our number one priority, we must um, be able to have the lens in which to support them. That comes from leadership. That comes from uh, the employees that serve them. That comes from the suppliers that support them to bring them the best service. So for us, it's a holistic ecosystem. We work closely with our DNI, our government affairs, from a um, Capitol Hill uh, policy and government perspective, and then also just from our HR, from our recruiting as well. So at the end of the day, we want to have an economic impact to those disadvantaged, and not only just to a supplier diversity, but also um, even the military hiring commitment that we just did as well, too. So. Um, a lot of what we do is really action-based and just really try to deliver, um, ultimately, at the end of the day, for our customers what they really want, so. Yeah. Well, certainly, workforce development is a part of the conversation around procurement best practices. I yes. think we all would agree. Uh, certainly, Verizon, AT&T, uh, they're doing, I'm sure, similar things around organizational construct and how best to have your diversity units interact with your technology folks. So, mm -hmm. Pat, you want to kind of weigh in on what you're doing and we'll hear from your vet? Absolutely. Okay. Um, our supplier diversity organization uh, is currently lined up within the Global Diversity and Inclusion Organization. Um, a number of years back, about three, four years back, we were part of the sourcing organization. Now, over the last six years, um, we've, we've worked with diverse suppliers to the tune of over $30 billion of diverse spend. And since we've been in or lined with the Global Diversity and Inclusion Organization, last year alone, we did over $5 billion with diverse suppliers. And I, I say that to, to stress a point that being part of the Global and Diversity Inclusion Organization has given us direct access to our CEO and our C-suite. Uh, that's via our Senior Vice President of uh, Talent and Diversity. Um, she's part of those meetings every three months. Each one of our C-suite executives have or, or provided a dashboard, and part of that dashboard includes their diverse spend, their top diverse suppliers, where there's some gaps, where there's some opportunities. So because they're now involved personally, and similar to what, what my colleague Chi had mentioned earlier, um, it's also hitting everyone in their pockets as well. So when, like, like you mentioned, when, when you're hitting some pockets, um, sometimes action happens. Um, but even above and beyond where it's hitting them, this is what they truly believe, this is what they truly feel, this is what they truly support. 
And it shows in the numbers that we've, we've put across um, over the last few years. Mm -hmm. So um, we are lined up through HR, um, and it's been working well. Yeah. So performance and results kind of go hand in hand on this conversation. Absolutely. Sure Absolutely. So Yvette? Well, at AT&T, we have a phenomenal supply diversity team. Uh, it's led by Jelena Bolden, who is a phenomenal director, and we have 13 employees strategically placed all over the country. We are located here in Washington, D.C., in Texas, California, New Jersey, Georgia, and Illinois. And our team is comprised of different segments. We have supply diversity specialists. We have supply diversity advocates. We have a communications advocate, a governance and compliance specialist, okay. and an analytics and report specialist. And we also collaborate with our sourcing managers, with our business units, and with the community to make sure we have the best in class supply diversity program. Mm -hmm. And again, there are 13 of us. Yeah. Thank you. Well, 13, that's quite, that's quite a large number. So um, let's kind of change the conversation just a little bit, but certainly related to what we've been talking about all along. Um, so procurement best practices is the theme that we talk about all of the time. And so from a diversity and supplier perspective, the jobs that you all have, uh, have <coughs> you been able to have conversation with other managers in your organization, particularly on the procurement side, about procurement best practices and uh, to the extent that what you do fits into those new paradigms that your organization, anyone can weigh in on that uh, sure. first. Uh, you want to start, Pat, with yeah, the yeah, conversation about that? that. Um, it, it definitely it works well for us. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're part of the uh, Global Diversity and Inclusion Organization, but we sit within our sourcing and procurement peers. Every RFQ we're involved in, um, the contracts that we let all have diverse participation goals. They all have targets for all of our suppliers. Um, everyone on the sourcing team is involved with that. Um, it, it goes back to our legal organization as well. Uh, our prime suppliers, they're all aware of that. They're made aware of that. And our diverse suppliers are also uh, well aware of that as well. Um, one of the things that we also started to do two years ago is we went outside of our sourcing and procurement organization and we went to the business and created what we call business champions. So we have regular bi-weekly meetings with these business champions who are designated um, individuals and they were designated by executives within those lines of business to work with our supply diversity team and let us know of any process changes, um, any opportunities, any challenges where there may be where we need some diverse participation. So it, we, it works well with us sitting with sourcing, being part of global diversity and inclusion, and the results are starting and really paying off, they're showing. Okay, anyone else, with, uh, Megan, you wanna um, chant And so I, I also sit with, within procurement, um, and we have a little sort of the opposite slice of, I sit within procurement, uh, but we have a heavy dotted line. I work very closely um, with our diversity inclusion team. I think from a best practice perspective, um, w the best, I, I sort of talk about supplier diversity as the best way for me to accomplish what I'm trying to do is to get out of the way as quickly as possible, meaning I want to vet a diverse supplier, make sure they are who they say they are, make sure I understand enough about their product, your product or service to connect you to the right sourcing manager. But at Charter, we actually invest in developing the sourcing team to be a part of the supplier diversity program. Uh, that investment shows up in the way that they are connected to the diverse supplier, so they're expected to have those conversations to, to see you know what product or service uh, you know, what's the cadence of our RFP, what, what they, could they be included, um, and on what time frame. But then we also invest in sending them to supplier diversity conferences. So uh, I think that's important for two factors. You know, certainly from an internal perspective, you have sourcing managers becoming more aware about supplier diversity. They have sort of the educational opportunity to really understand what it means rather than just kind of, you know, sit in their day-to-day -day role. They get to step out of that and really see it. But then, of course, it's the matchmaking, the expos, the opportunity to actually interact with diverse suppliers uh, is positive for the diverse suppliers as well, right? So you have a greater chance uh, as a diverse supplier to come across uh, the sourcing manager who might actually be the person um, working with our business units to source that individual product or service. Yeah, great. Chief? Yeah, Chief? so at T-Mobile, again, I think a centralized procurement organization um, helps manage and control um, spend in suppliers and help to facilitate what is the um, right uh, amount of suppliers, right? Because mm -hmm. I think when you talk about procurement organizations, um, 
more suppliers can mean more challenges. However, the right supplier can help you maximize that spend that's there. Um, with the recent promotion of my senior vice president, he now is accountable for the technology purchases as well too, so the networks, the sales sites. So that to me, just the uh, organizational um, consolidation is going to be a, a positive impact both to diverse suppliers and um, small supply, uh, business suppliers as well too. So the recent change that happened, instead of a commodity manager working horizontally, now sourcing managers work vertically. So a team of procurement or sourcing will support a VP of marketing. So within the marketing, there could be multiple spends in direct, indirect, and in this case, technology support needs. And so not only is the sourcing manager incented and motivated because they all, we all report to the same vice president, but they're also educating the business unit as well about the importance of not only sourcing in the right way, but to maximizing the spend, but also to having that narrative and that conversation about including diverse suppliers. Because at the end of the day, the business unit is the one that's saying, here's my need. Here's that widget, here's that service that I need. The sourcing team goes out and gets it for them. So to educate both the business unit, who's the budget owner, the sourcing team that goes and procures that, and then the team that looks at the overall spend that happens with it, um, it, is, it is yielding some significant um, spend, and obviously we still have some work to do, but I think that's one of the best practices that we have. Yeah, great, great. Yvette, yes. Our focus is primarily on our lofty goal and also our prime supplier program. Uh, we've continued our extraordinary legacy of supplier diversity spend, and our inclusion goal is 21.5%. However, we're elated to announce that in 2017, the diversity spend was 25.2% of AT&T's overall spend, which represents $14.4 billion in spend with MBEs, WBEs, SDVBs, and LGBTEs. And notably, this is an, a $181 million increase with diverse suppliers over our 2016 results. But since 1989, we've had something um, known as the AT&T Prime Supplier Program, which has been really instrumental in helping our prime suppliers increase their spend with diverse suppliers. Our diversity managers collaborate with our prime suppliers to create meaningful goals and develop detailed plans for util utilization of diverse suppliers to encourage uh, development of innovative solutions. You'll hear me use that word innovation a lot mm -hmm. today for tracking and improving their results. So on a monthly basis, we actually monitor the performance of our prime suppliers, and we identify any of those primes who are underperforming so that we can work with them to create creative actions and solutions. And in 2017, our prime suppliers program focused on increasing both overall results and the number of contracts awarded to our diverse suppliers. And in 2017, $1.7 billion of our tier two spend was with diverse suppliers. And 48 of our prime suppliers actually received something known as a crystal award, which uh, rewards our prime suppliers who exceeded our 21.5% lofty goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, this is great. I, I certainly have a better understanding of internally how your organizations um, operate from a governance perspective and from a procurement best practice perspective. I think our audience will probably want to know where is the business and how we can get some, you know? And so we, <laughs> <laughs> so let's kind of turn the conversation about uh, around um, how our businesses should approach your organization. So, um, so what would you um, say would be the best methods for diverse suppliers to navigate your organization now that they have a better understanding of, of your organization? Uh, how best can they now come into your organization and, and uh, see opportunities and win opportunities and compete for opportunities. Who would like to kick this off, Chet? I'd like to say is um, prior to engaging any one of my peers or any supplier diversity office within a company that you're um, bidding to compete for is do some pre-homework. Your standard, this is my capabilities material, 40,000 level, here's what I do, it's not gonna cut it. Um, we get 500 of those every day, right? What's gonna differentiate you? What is the service unique niche that you can bring and offering? Um, just what I call is like the pre-homework. Get that done, understand who your audience is, understand who that point of contact is, is it procurement? Is it a supplier diversity advocate? Because guess what? If you start speaking T's and C's with a supplier diversity person, you're gonna lose them, right? And then some, if you're speaking with the sourcing folks, um, they may not be as versed in the supplier diversity narrative. So understand who that is as well too. And I really do believe taking that that time to do that pre-homework, understand that company, understand the industry they're in, understand where are they investing, 
Where are they going as a company? What's their mission? Do they have a supplier diversity program? Just doing those basic things will get you a lot further away. And then I'd say um, timing. Timing as well, because I, I see a, a gentleman over there who we were on the MMTC council uh, or conference uh, panelist uh, earlier this year. And at that time, my senior vice president wasn't accountable for the network side. Now he is. And so we can restart that conversation, right? And so timing is also important. So um, I'd say pre-homework and timing and patience with that. Good. Who, it, Do you want to go, go Pat? Ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, um, just, I mean, to build on that, I think it's the most compelling diverse suppliers actually approach supplier diversity and or the sourcing managers with the identification of the problem they're helping us solve, mm -hmm. right? So if you can articulate that kind of, if you can take your capability statement and, and you know you obviously are experts at your product and service, and oftentimes you're gonna interact with someone like us who are supplier diversity professionals, right? So, so we're again, kind of to connect that, we're trying our best to connect you with the sourcing manager, but really, when you can, you, when you say, "Hey, I know your business well enough, right? Charter or you know any of my peers that I know you're having this problem," um, it's really compelling um, statement, and it actually will will get you kind of forwarded on and, and you know increase the potential, mm -hmm. versus just here's my capability statement. Okay. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Um, one of the things I like to say is, do your best to know what's around a corner before you get there. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, where are we going? How can I be involved? How can my partnership with the corporation take both of us to the next level? That, that's tremendous. And as, as my peer here said earlier, innovation. Um, I was gonna say the same thing. I'm gonna be using that word a lot also. Uh, be very innovative, okay? Don't come in saying, what do you need? No, we're looking for someone to come in and say, this is what I believe we need to do together to get you here and get me up to this next level. Okay. Yvette? I'll tell what my esteemed colleagues have said. You know, they say you have to hear something seven times before it sinks in, so I'm going to tell you again. you really got to learn not only about what we're doing now, but what we're doing in the future, yeah, yeah. okay? Because it's ever-changing global technology. You have to look to the future as well and really understand the needs of the corporation and, and how you can fulfill those requirements. And again, the, the big word, innovate, innovate, innovate. You have to be willing to bring us new products and services that not only are innovative, but more efficient and more cost-effective. Then you have to be persistent and patient. Sometimes it takes years to garner relationships and business uh, with a company. And a lot of times it's being at the right place at the right time, meeting the right people, like being here, okay? Mm -hmm. And then finally, we have a website, and it's www.attsupplierdiversity.com. I'm going to repeat again nice and slow, www.att suppliardiversity.com and there's no ampersand between the two T's. Navigate the websites before you go on and again, uh, I couldn't agree more with what my colleagues have said. Yeah, so as we, so yeah, Chief, please, yes. Is, um, okay. You know, we're all family here, right? There's about 50 of us, we're all, we're all family in here. <laughs> we're all related. We're yes, all related. <laughs> um, I think each, and, each one of you have to look at yourself and your business and say, are you actually ready to land a Charter, T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T? That's kind of a tough question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have the passion? No doubt. Do you have the vision of what you want to take your company to? Sure, right? You're the secret sauce, I get it. However, is your company ready to take that large step to scale, mm -hmm. to be able to be competitive in the marketplace against the quote unquote big players in the space, mm -hmm. right? Because you can't look at it from a one-time transactional activity. If you're gonna low bid it just to win that one-time transaction, you're probably gonna lose out in the long run. So you gotta look at it from a long-term partnership. Are you truly ready to be a long-term partner for these big companies out there? And if you can't answer that and say, you know what, we're ready to go right now. If I was to win that bid 30 days from now, can we execute to there? And can we meet their um, SLAs and all their service requirements? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the real tough question. And if you think you're ready, pull the trigger and I'd love to speak to you. Yeah. And there are some organizations, profits and nonprofit organizations that work with small businesses to help stand them up and get them ready to come to you. Sure, and right. I, I mean, yeah. I happen to have, you know, again, I sit on the uh, NMSDC board for the regional council. Mm -hmm. Here's what I do, I ask the, the WE banks, the NMSDCs, the LGBT and GLCCs say, what is your top three suppliers that you would recommend without any hesitation in this space? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. If you're not one of those top three, guess what? It's going to be a tough conversation in terms of you guys landing or you guys and gals landing that opportunity. So I would say that's 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 what you need to really have that conversation about, right? Okay. Yeah, Megan? Can I, I just yes, wanted please. to call in the comment um, made slightly earlier from Yvette around in innovation and, and Pat, because um, I think it's such a big word, and it's often, you know, I, I'm, I'm imagining how it sounds when you're a diverse supplier. You have all these other pressures, and it's like, okay, but go ahead and innovate. Do more, you know, do more <laughs> with kind of your existing resources. But I'd like to kind of say my definition of that, because I think it kind of speaks to the technology question, okay. perhaps. Um, we often talk about, you know, as companies, we are innovating. We're putting forward new technologies. I think there's also an opportunity as a diverse supplier to look inward with the uh, advanced use of technology, meaning what do I mean? There's big data, there's artificial intelligence, there's virtual reality, there's all these opportunities now in the marketplace, and you're often asked, what is your differentiator, right? That's one of the questions you've heard from us, and it's one of the questions you'll keep getting when you interact with su supplier diversity professionals, and so I've, I've started to see diverse suppliers who are actually taking the lessons around, you know, what's happening in our industry and applying them inside their companies. And it is a really powerful differentiator. I know it can be big and amorphous, but you know, if, if you as a, a, a company have found an innovative use of technology to be cost saving within your own business, right? Or to have a differentiated product or service, that is something that, again, is really powerful, it differentiates you in these conversations and make the conversations a little bit easier to have with us for what it is that you're doing that's really interesting, innovative, and powerful. So that was just, I, yeah. I don't wanna just say the word innovation because I feel that we all use it and it's a great term and it's also a very opaque term and yeah. sometimes. Well, yeah. no, I think that's a wonderful clarification of that. Yeah, I think the audience would appreciate that as well. So prescriptively, we've talked about um, industry briefings as a way of getting information out uh, if I'm a small business and I want to do business with either one of you all, I would think that I'd want to know or at least be aware of your industry briefings that your CFO and CEO, they give these things two or three times a year mm -hmm. uh, and they are public exposed and so small business and diverse companies can certainly participate and read about those. Uh, SEC filings, I mean, this is an area of information that small businesses and uh, myself personally, we don't pay enough attention to the SEC filings. Just a wealth of information in those SEC filings. Uh, uh, even to the extent of how much officers make, you know, in those That's corporations, right. it's there. It's public disposal if they're publicly mm -hmm. traded. Uh, and then uh, to know the corporate structure, and we've talked about that. I mean, you've spoken about corporate structure. Uh, and, and then there's just a plethora of publications that are available to, uh, to small and diverse companies. If we would read them and digest them and apply them to what you all do, and I think it would be very helpful. Um, and then building relationships. Uh, Megan, you talked about mm -hmm. and others about building positive relationships uh, with your organizations is certainly a very important step. And so those are some prescriptive examples of how these companies can come to you all and be successful, uh, at least have a fighting chance and a level playing field to be successful, and that's really important. So um, one of the conversations has been around mentoring, mentoring programs, and, and so um, within your organizations, do you have mentor, mentor protege like initiatives that they're probably not called that, but do you have anything similar to that in your organization? And anyone can kick the conversation off, it's fine. I'll start. Yeah, okay, you bet. Actually, there are three major programs that AT&T provides, okay. um, which is executive level scholarships to diverse suppliers as part of our commitment to education. And in 2017, we actually sponsored three uh, scholarships were awarded to MBE and WBE programs. The first one is the Advanced Management Education Program, and that's in collaboration between NMSDC and Northwestern University. And that's a custom executive program created by the NMSDC in partnership with Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. And they provide certified, established expansion orient minority business enterprise with skills and tools needed to achieve and sustain accelerated growth. We also have the Building and High Performance Minority Business Program, and that's at Dartmouth University, and that program is designed for diverse businesses who are committed to advancing their businesses' um, capabilities. And it's a curriculum that actually mixes strategy and operations to help owners leverage a value chain to, vil, uh, to fulfill their advantages. And then the third one is the Tuck we Bank program, um, that's also out of Dartmouth University, mm -hmm. and that's a strategic growth program for women businesses who are dedicated to the advancement and success of their business. That's a, that's a six-day, extremely intensive course that's designed for WeBees and their executive teams to 
um, who are ready to plan and execute a business strategy that will elevate their company to the next level. And then finally, we have our own program. It's called the BGAP program, the Business Growth Acceleration Program. And last year, that was led through the JFK Institute of Entrepreneurial Leadership, uh, which mentored a select group of qualified businesses. And it's a hand-on learning approach that enables participants to immediately apply concepts they've learned. And there were nine graduates last year. And then finally, we have a plethora of all types of informal and formal mentoring. We will actually mentor people on the telephone. We mentor people face-to-face. -face, uh, we have mentoring during our match matchmaking sessions, so I'm really looking forward to those matchmaking sessions because it gives me an opportunity to give feedback to people and mentor them. I look at their business cards, I look at their presentations, I listen to their etiquette. I really listen and give good feedback, so I can't wait to talk to you all this afternoon. <laughs> Uh, anyone else would like to weigh in on that on that part of this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Earlier, I mentioned we have a, a formal mentoring program called Edge: Educate, Develop, Grow, and Enrich. Okay, that's one program we have where the senior executives are aligned with uh, diverse businesses that we're currently doing business with, and it's not to necessarily give them opportunities to grow within our company, but it's really to take them to a next to their next level within the industry. So it's not necessarily doing business with Verizon, but it could be doing business with anyone else out there. Uh, second program we have is a premier supplier academy where the supplier diversity team, the business and sourcing, meet with diverse businesses that we're currently not doing business with to give them opportunities to do business with us. That program goes on for about a year or so. We continue to mentor them over time and we meet with them over a period of time. Yeah. On top of that, we have a program called Hiring Our Heroes, where we work with veterans that are coming back home, and if any veterans are out there, thank you for your service and your families as well. Um, we work with the veterans coming back home. We bring them in as interns and let them figure out where they think they may fit within the company, and we help mentor them and help find them an opportunity to do work within Verizon. So that's just a couple of our programs that we're currently doing. And similar to what you were uh, just talking about, the supply diversity team, we mentor folks on a regular basis. The matchmaking, again, we do the same thing. I'm looking at business cards, looking at the websites, I'm looking at everything. Um, give you an example, um, a number of years ago, I met with uh, a group of folks, and they met with me, and I'm dressed, this is a business meeting, and I'm dressed like this, and they showed up like they came out of a, uh, a concert, so to speak. Um, slouched down, not confident. You want to you, you want to position yourself like this is the one and only meeting I'm going to have with this corporation. I'm ready to do business. I'm stepping out there. I'm giving you everything I have. Let's go. Right. Good. Okay. Anything in addition to add, uh, Megan or Chi? Anything? We pretty much covered it. Then. Okay. Well, good. Thanks a lot. So, um, one of the um, impediments, I think for small and diverse companies um, in trying to attain large requirements uh, at your organizations uh, is this notion of bundling. And we're not passing any comment on whether or not it's a good idea or a bad idea, but to the extent that there is bundling uh, and first-tier opportunities, more than often, uh, small companies don't have the bandwidth to compete individually. And so the concept of getting companies to network together uh, to form collaborations, partnerships, et cetera, uh, could be a pathway for small businesses to get large opportunities. Uh, is that something your companies are thinking about, would embrace, and if so, uh, what have you done so far to, to look at that? Anyone? Uh, Chi, would you like to go first? So, um, okay. the, my, prior to my, there was two stents that I spent with T-Mobile. Um, I worked for an MBE for several years, and this MBE was a uh, VAR, mm -hmm. two billion in sales. Yeah. That, Pretty big numbers, we right? We know who that is, by the way. Right? <laughs> um, and it was interesting is I, as the director of supplier diversity and sustainability, still had to sell the value that this company, as an MBE, could bring savings to large corporations, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Even though they showed them the big logos that they worked with, showed them their years of experience that they had with, I just believe that there's this notion and stigma out there that diverse suppliers, small businesses cannot deliver. You know, and I think that's some of the challenges that um, still are faced today. And so for, for, for T-Mobile, um, it's important for us to, one, is the company ready? Is the, is the supplier ready to, to, to compete for the business? And then from there, um, the bundling piece of it is, is, one, if you don't have that ability in your 
in, in your uh, portfolio of what you can offer in terms of a good or service. Um, I think bundling is an, uh, is an option there, but from a procurement perspective, the more you bundle, the more complex it gets, mm -hmm. right? And so anytime you introduce a new supplier, especially a bundled component supplier, it's that much more to offboard the incumbent, replace it with this bundled, the T's and C's and the lawyer uh, legal gets into involved in it. And so anytime change happens, it becomes uncomfortable, right? So there's the stigma of you can't scale, you can't niche, and then now you want to bundle and the complexity of the change to it. Um, so those are some of, I think, the perspectives, at least I hear from some, from some sourcing folks, mm -hmm. where we as advocates have to come in and say, you know what, change isn't, it's going to be uncomfortable, but it can be profitable and done in the right way, right? And so yeah. that's something that um, I think it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation that yeah. it still needs to happen. No, that, that's good. So we, we got to move along a little quickly, but come, Megan, please, I want to hear your comments and oh, others oh, too on this it's point. It's just a quick yes. comment. I think the um, bundling, I, I think about it a little bit differently. Okay. So it's like within uh, Charter and it's with a lot of our businesses, each business unit will have a different need, right? So some business units do have a need for something that has to be national in scale, um, and other business units are actually more designed for regionalized, which might be a little bit more, if you will, smaller or broken up, right? And something that has maybe more bite sized opportunity for diverse suppliers. So I think it is something just to consider, again, back to that know your business. You know your product and service. You're an expert at that. Mm -hmm. And if it's something that a company like ours really does have at a national scale, it's going to be harder to break in. But that doesn't mean those are the only things, um, uh, the only opportunities that we provide as companies. A lot of our uh, prioritization is on regionalized because we recognize there actually can be better um, service sometimes at a smaller scale. Yeah, it's amazing how time flies. Uh, I think we've reached the end of our road here. I would wanted my panelists to weigh in with some last comments, but I think the audience got a nice feel of what you do and uh, how committed you are to this whole issue of not only being invited to the dance, but to ask me to dance once I get there. And so we really appreciate that. I would like to say that in addition to Dartmouth and to my good friends from UVA, there is a Darden School, too, that offers these, this work as well. So a shout out to, to UVA. So uh, please join me in thanking our panelists um, for the fireside chat with me. And uh, we hope to see you in the matchmaking session. Thank you very much. Thank you, audience. Well done. Thank you. I think the notion was that we were done, but you weren't done. So we, wanted, <laughs> we, would, we would like to hear your questions. So who has a list of questions? Or oh, they can go to the microphone with their questions. Please, go right ahead. Who's first? Would you give your name and your organization that you represent? That would be helpful. Okay. And perhaps uh, if you could keep your question uh, somewhat short and, we, and have an elongated answer. Yeah, this is Prince Nair with Comdex. Uh, I, just, I was just wondering, do you as a corporation track first time minority supplier spend? Means suppliers that are working with your company for the first time. And the second question, I like the, kind of the educational programs that you guys have in place. So in order for any supplier to be uh, eligible for that, is there any criteria that you guys have, have as a company? Be good to know. So let's have one respondent, and if there's a different view, we'll have a second respondent. Is that fair? Or who would like to kick that, would like to respond to that? Anyone? Uh, from a tracking perspective, okay. it, it's, it's difficult to say um, whether it's your first time or repeat because based on whether you renew in your certification or not is the way that we report our measurements. And so it's very difficult because if you can imagine tracking the research versus non-cert and there's that enrichment process that happens. So at T-Mobile we don't because it's just too much data intensive work that has to happen with that. Is that the general sense of all of y'all that someone has a yeah, different response? Very, very yeah. same, very same. Uh, but if, we've, if, we've uh, helped, if we've helped a company certify, we track that, but that's just a yes, no, not a different. Okay, is there someone else would like to ask a question? Uh, Marita? Hi. Hi, Marita Coley from MMTC. So, Chi, you mentioned that uh, sometimes suppliers need to be very honest with themselves and examine their um, business and see if they're ready for you know, T-Mobile or Charter. So can anybody uh, give some tips as to how they might navigate that process safely? Like where would they start to even determine whether they were ready? And the second question is, does anyone do uh, any advertising procurement or advertising supplier diversity? Okay. So for T-Mobile, I would say is, um, as Mr. Dr. Johnson was saying was, you can look at the uh, FCC filings. 
um, see that T-Mobile just invested 600 million in, um, uh, excuse me, uh, 600 megahertz. 5G network rollout is a big thing. Um, if you're in the IT space or the uh, cell tower space, you're going to realize, well, there's retrofitting that has to happen. So those are the conversations I think that um, would need to be looked at to say, can, do you fit in that space? But then also as a company grows, um, and there's this potential conversation out there about T-Mobile and another company, um, <laughs> can you help in that space, right? So, um, you know, I think not knowing your business, I'd love to talk to you to see. And then like our panelists said, there's a mentoring opportunity to see what those next steps could be to see if you're ready. Can I make just, yes, yeah, sorry. Please. It's like, I, I think I took your question as, is there a safe place? Because um, it can be intimidating. Um, so I encourage folks to always see supplier diversity as a, a safe place. Um, and then there, we all are members of national organizations. There's a lot of nonprofits for each mm -hmm. organ, right? So NMSCC, I see Susan from USPAC, um, WeBank, NGLCC. Those organizations do have a lot of supplier development opportunities, and they can, again, be a safe place. So you can actually, I think, get a lot of good feedback from working with those organizations. Anyone else? Or? Yeah, I'd like to add that um, with regard to like opportunities, uh, we have uh, AT&T Mobility Turf Vendor Conferences that are coming up this year. Uh, basically, what we're going to be doing is uh, collaborating with primes and subcontracting opportunities for our AT&T Mobility and Broadband Network construction build out. And we're going to have these uh, across the country in different regions because we have opportunities coming up for new site builds, wireless loop and bandwidth expansion, and then also we're going to have opportunities in the software development and software defined networks and application development. So that dovetails back to what we were saying about, uh, and we're, we're strategically located and we're at all these events and we talked about it briefly before, but getting engaged and being active and building the relationships with people. So in these one-on-one -on -one matchmaking sessions where we can be very candid, diplomatically candid with you to tell you what you, how you need to improve. Mm -hmm. And AT&T has a major initiative with FirstNet. Absolutely. I think your investment was $8 billion, I believe, to that, and great opportunities for diverse companies to participate. Three weeks ago, your company had a seminar symposium mm -hmm. on um, diverse opportunities in yes, FirstNet. Exactly. Uh, well received and well done, too. Thank you. A any other questions from the audience? Yes, sir, your name and organization, please. Good afternoon. My name is Supreme McKeel with Tech Go To Guys. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a question about uh, once you, uh, for instance, the website, the AT&T Supplier Diversity, once you register there, what are some of the factors that would set you apart from maybe the thousands or tens of thousands of registrants that you get? Anyone? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, um, you can register. You can go to verizon.com forward slash supplier diversity. But I highly recommend that you attend forums such as this. Um, the advocacy organizations we have out there, attend those forums as well, those outreach efforts. Um, you want to you want to be visible. You want to be you want to be present. You want to be seen. You want to meet with someone because, as you mentioned, there are thousands and thousands of suppliers that enter their information into the systems, into the databases. And that isn't necessarily going to set you apart from another one. We want to be able to see you, hear you, feel you, things like that. I want to also add that when you complete the um, survey online, make sure you complete everything. Uh, don't leave anything out. Um, and also use synonyms like uh, there was one company that was a landscaping company that also, you could say, uh, you know, maintenance, uh, grass cutting. Um, also, they did snow removal. So how you fill that out, because we use what they call search engine optimization, you know, you, you have to be, you have make sure that it's accurate and don't leave anything out and don't assume anything. Uh, you know, call and ask questions if you don't understand something. But I totally agree with what you were saying about making sure that you get out and talk to people so you can put a face to your name. The relationship building is very important here. So. Mm -hmm. uh, additional questions? Um, one you. more, and then this gentleman here, please. Your name and organization. Thanks very much. Yeah, Tom Morrissey, Adam, with uh, InRange Solutions, and I'm on the board for the New York State Wireless Association. So my question is pertaining to second-tier vendors for your companies. Do you have a program that looks at that? In our example, we're a prime vendor for T-Mobile. We're a second-tier vendor for Verizon and AT&T, and I'm wondering if there are programs that look at those second-tier vendors to move them to potentially a prime vendor. Good question. Who like this? Anyone want to weigh in on yeah, that? I'll, I'll speak Pat? to that. Um, yeah, we absolutely do look at our second-tier suppliers. We also look at their capabilities when we have access to see some of that. Some of the, some of our primes, um, uh, 
they, they use proprietary information, so to speak. Um, but most of our primes, we do have access to those second tier uh, suppliers such as yourself with us, and we do look at that. And we also, we put the responsibility on some of our primes, <coughs> excuse me, to, to mentor um, some of the suppliers that they're working with. Um, because we do love to move suppliers from second tier to a, pro to a, a first tier situation. Mm -hmm. And to add to that, as I mentioned to you, we have a new vision, so we're going to be looking at access to capital. We have a mentoring program, so more to come. Thank you for your yeah. question. Yeah. And as a part of the FAR requirement for federal government contracts, prime contractors are required to report up their second tier vending spends on federal contracts. So something to bear in mind. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Uh, we might have time for our panelists to wrap up with a minute each, unless there's another question. Um, so uh, we have about five minutes left, and we have four panelists. So uh, who would like to give a wrap-up? Anyone first at, at, your, at your election? Whoever would like to go first? Should I just go so we're in order? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <A little laughs> okay, easier. Megan. Um, oh, thank you all for the opportunity to participate today. Um, I think you've heard a lot from us about how important it is. We, I know it's a time investment, um, <coughs> more more so for the diverse suppliers, right? Because it's I, I know you're all running your businesses um, and so forth. So thank you for taking this opportunity. It really is important um, f to build a relationship with us, as, as you've heard. So I think my takeaway is you know engage with supplier diversity at Charter. Uh, we're we're definitely building in process. We have some things built, but we're definitely in process and have a trajectory of growth. So we're excited uh, to have this opportunity to interact with you all and help us grow as you guys grow too. Thank you again. Um, it was a great always to be part with Mr. Johnson and yeah. the peers here. Um, again, as uh, on a personal level, as a person of color, if I didn't believe that my company was sincere about their supplier diversity program, I wouldn't do it. And so I can confidently say that I believe in it. The DNA of the company is sincere. Um, and so, you know, I believe that um, through my role at the NMSDC Regional Council, um, I'd love to meet with each and every one of you, um, have conversations about what your, what your challenges are, what your struggles are, what we can do to partner. I can't guarantee you the contract. At least I can do is make the introductions to try to help you win the business. And from there, once you get in front of the sourcing, Folks, I always tell them, it's your barbecue from there. you got to figure out <laughs> if it tastes good or not with them. So um, I'd love to be able to have those conversations with you. So thank you again. Thank you. I want to thank everyone. Um, I, I do, I'm going to put an ask out to everyone out there, business owners. Um, it's nice to be a, a diverse owner of a business that has a contract or more contracts with a corporation. It's great. But the ask I have for everyone is, what are you doing to take it forward? What are you doing to bring others up with you? Okay, because it doesn't stop with the folks that are in this room. It doesn't stop with the folks that we know. Um, it's, it's our responsibility to help bring others along with us. That's, that's the spirit behind it. I live that. I love that. Um, I really challenge everyone to do the same. Well, that's a very engaging and holistic approach to procurement, and we appreciate that, Pat. I'm sure your colleagues certainly feel the same way because I know they do. Yvette? Well, on behalf of AT&T, I, I am really most grateful to be able to partake in this outstanding event. And needless to say, AT&T is absolutely passionate about our supplier diversity program and our best-in-class uh, program. And my advice to all of you is to keep learning, keep networking, and stay relevant. Yes. Thank you, gracias, and don quiche. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so thank you very much, uh, Ms. Beth Johnson and um, Director Sanford Williams for, for this event today. And please, again, join me in thanking our panelists for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. We're going to have a few minute break, then start with the second panel. So go to the, get some water, go to the bathroom, and come right back. Thank you all. Um, welcome to panel two. And before I get started, um, S. Janelle Trigg handed me a flyer. Um, Hudson Valley Wireless is hiring qualified contractors to assist with, assist with broadband deployment. She bought a bunch of flyers for any contractors who are interested at the front table. So that's a plug for um, Hudson Valley Wireless.
So we're at panel two, the supplier experience, succeeding as a diverse supplier. I have a stellar panel here today. Uh, but before I get started, uh, I mentioned earlier I'm, I can kind of be irreverent. Um, I have three kids, a uh, 29-year-old daughter who's an attorney in California. My son is 27, and he's in medical school in North Carolina. And my youngest daughter is a rising second year at the University of Virginia. And I love to bring them with me places, and I love to point them out because I'm proud of them. Um, one of our panelists, Nina, has her daughter Amanda here, who's a rising first year at UT, right, UT Austin, hook em horns, you know, I know that much. Um, communications major, so any of you guys with communications jobs in the future, you know, keep her name in mind, look out for her, you know, because she's going to be doing great things. Uh, so I know, like, I love having my kids here, so I'm glad that you're here. Even though my kids aren't here, I'm glad you're here. So thank you. Um, I want to introduce, uh, introduce our panelists. First, um, we'll get pronounced the name right, Prince Nayar Comdex, um, Nina Vaca from the Pinnacle Group, Chris James from the National Center for American Indian Enterprise Development, um, Charles Harrell, um, let me make sure I get this right, president of the IT Architect, thank you, uh, Sabrina uh, G. Kent, chief of staff of the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce, and we have one substitute panelist who's still awesome, uh, Wayne Kimball, Act One Group, VP for Corporate Strategy and uh, Government Solutions. I'm going to have each of these fine folks give an introduction, um, say a little bit about themselves, whatever they want to talk about. If they want to rap Hamilton like I did, you know, they can do that too, you, you know. Uh, as you can tell, I'm obsessed with Hamilton. But anyway, um, give them a minute to talk. After they say their introductions, I have some questions prepared. We'll have some audience interaction as well, and we'll just go from there. Hopefully, we'll have a good ride. Um, we'll start with, with Prince. Well, thank you. First of all, uh, thank you, Sanford, for inviting me here. Um, and I want to thank particularly Susan Allen, because I wouldn't have been here unless Susan invited me here. But uh, one thing I've learned over the years is when Susan calls, you never say no. Yes, She's I a, agree. She is a force of nature, let me tell you that. But, uh, but anyhow, um, um, I'm with Comdex. Uh, we've been in business for the last 18 years. What we do as a business is we build, design, and manage communication systems. What I mean by that is uh, if you have people in the field who need to stay connected with each other, we kind of build systems that connect them to each other, whether it's, whether it's sharing voice, video, or data. We build those communication systems. And what we use is the, the frequencies that FCC has. We use those frequencies as the highways to keep them connected. And the other thing we do is we keep the first responders in the field connected with the 911 systems or command center, whatever you may want to call it. So if you look at the triangle sort of keeping these people connected when seconds can make a difference between life and death, that's what we do as a business. And I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Nina? Good afternoon, Stanford. I have to tell you that, um, Stanford, I have to tell you that you, you stole my heart already mm -hmm. by mentioning my daughter. Uh, in business uh, or in life, it's all about inspiring the next generation and those who come after us. So thank you for doing that. Uh, my name is Nina Vaca. I am founder and chief executive officer of the Pinnacle Group. We're proud to be one of the largest Latina-owned businesses in America in the workforce solution space. And two weeks ago, proud to be the fastest growing women-owned business in America. I am here. Um, we have been in business for 22 years. And I am here because to who much is given, much is expected. I'm here to talk about my 22-year journey. And in 22 years, it took us 22 years to become an overnight sensation. I'm here with an open heart and an open mind to talk about um, any experiences. I believe that we are a living and breathing embodiment of everything you just heard on the panel. Uh, we became a supplier at Verizon when we were just five years in business. We became a supplier at AT&T, six years in business, and 13 years in business, we became a strategic partner to Comcast. So I'm here to talk about my experiences, uh, not just the talk, but the walk that these companies are doing. I am also part of, uh, actually, a self-appointed president of the Susan Allen Fan Club as well. <laughs> Susan Allen may be the president of the US Pan-Asian Chamber of Commerce, but make no mistake, she extends across communities, to the African-American community, to the GLBT community, and to the Hispanic community. And her leadership is known in every single community. Thank you, Susan, for the invitation. Thank you, and I'll jump in real quick. I think we have a mutual admiration society. I did research on all the panelists beforehand, and I saw a letter that Nina had written to her daughters. And I have two daughters, like I said, so I showed my wife, I said, look at this, this is pretty cool. So uh, I appreciate your love of family and the importance of family, and um, thank you for being here. Chris. Thank you, Sanford. 
Hi, good morning, everyone. And uh, Sanford, thank you very much uh, for um, asking me to be on this panel. My name is Chris James. I am uh, with the National Center for American Indian Enterprise Development. We are uh, the largest uh, American Indian Alaska Native Trade Association that focuses on economic and business development uh, in our communities throughout the United States. Uh, primarily, I work with uh, tribes or uh, small businesses that want to enter the national supply chain, specifically federal government, as well as uh, private sector as well. Uh, and uh, historically, I was at the Small Business Administration um, up until December of 2016. Uh, a few of my initiatives while I was there, one in particular was called Supplier Pay, uh, which focused on helping small businesses uh, get paid faster, uh, as well as the American Supplier Initiative, where we uh, did supplier events for two years all over the country. So very, very happy to be here. Thank you. Good morning, all. Uh, first and foremost, thank you, Sanford, for inviting me to uh, this uh, event. Um, I'm not necessarily new. Um, I, at one time, I sat on the, uh, the, one of the uh, FCC advisory committees before they recharted it. Uh, nevertheless, uh, my name is Charles Farrell II. I'm the president and CEO of the IT Architect Corporation. I've uh, been in business since 1999, and uh, the interesting history is that I started off in investment banking, finance, and also as an attorney. Uh, then transitioned uh, during that time into the telecom space. Um, actually, our team underwrote uh, Research in Motion, which is the brand uh, BlackBerry. Um, nevertheless, uh, started the company, the IT Architect Corporation, in May of 2003. And uh, what we do is we design, implement, and manage the automation of business processes and building controls with innovative telecom technology solutions. Uh, our, our core business revolves around order fulfillment. Uh, kind of liken our, our software that we've created from ground up to Amazon's B2C uh, order fulfillment. So we've got a B2B version of that going to market. So uh, again, uh, very excited to be here today and talk about our experiences as well. Thank you. Thank you. Sabrina. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Sabrina Kent. I serve as Chief of Staff at the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce, otherwise known as NGLCC. I too would be remiss if I did not thank Susan Allen for including us in this important dialogue today. So thank you, Susan and Sanford. Thank you for coordinating this panel. Um, so at NGLCC, we rep represent the economic uh, impact of LGBT-owned businesses across the country and around the world. Uh, for us, it's most important to uh, presume that these LGBT-owned businesses, like all diverse enterprises, uh, have a seat at the economic table. We want to ensure that they have that. So we work with over a third of the Fortune 500 to create opportunities uh, for, for our LGBT-owned businesses, as well as with government agencies uh, across the United States. We have over 15 global uh, affiliate chambers, as well as over 50 across the United States. Uh, it's just a pleasure to be here, so thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Wayne Kimball, Jr. I serve as the Vice President of Corporate Strategy and uh, Government Solutions for the Act One Group. Um, first and foremost, I know I'm not the stunning uh, Mrs. Janice bryant Harroyd, who you see listed in the book, um, who is also my fearless leader and outstanding CEO. Um, however, she sends her regrets that she was not able to be here today um, as her plane did not get back in from Europe on time. Uh, nonetheless, we're happy for the Act One Group to uh, be represented here today. And the Act One Group um, is a full-service global workforce solutions company. Um, we also uh, focus on technology that enables organizations. So uh, we are very proud to uh, now be the largest privately held um, woman-owned corporation in the country, as well as the second largest um, African-American owned firm in the United States. Um, the reason why it's so important for us to be a part of this dialogue, uh, similar to what others have said on the panel, um, is to give back to where we've come from. The Act One Group was started over 40 years ago. Um, actually, this year marks our 40th year in business, and we're very excited to share the story that we started uh, with just one office, one desk, one telephone, um, and at that time, one telephone book. Um, and, and that's how we built our business. But today, we are now doing business in 22 countries with brick and mortar in 19. Um, and so we're very excited to share that story. We're also very excited to, to meet with uh, many of the smaller organizations in the room so that you see um, that, that 
it doesn't matter how small you are now, but it's all about what you can offer and how you can continue to grow. Um, and we're also uh, very happy to be here with the FCC where uh, Mrs. Hyroid serves on the advisory board as well as amongst many of our existing clients like AT&T um, and other people in the telecom arena. So thank you so much for having me and I'm very excited to be here with the rest of my colleagues. Well, thank you for being here. So I'll start off with the first question. Um, it may seem obvious, but I don't think it is. Why is it important to have diverse suppliers? Why, do we, why are we doing this? Why is it important? Well, I think, um, firstly, I, I, I would not have been here was it not for the supplier diversity programs. I think uh, when I came here 25 years ago, my first job was a minimum wage job, mopping floors. To go from there to where I'm sitting here today, that's a success story. That's an American dream that could not have been possible without the um, uh, diversity programs. And to me, I think that's testament to the fulfillment of American dream, that if you come here and you're willing to work hard, there are opportunities here that you can realize your dream. And to be able to give my kids a future that even I could not have envisioned when I came here 25 years ago, that's the American dream, and I'm glad. Uh, and I think that's the power of diversity programs. But more than individual, I think, what it, where it, I think diversity spans to across the entire society. I think when you take, I mean, corporations obviously benefit because uh, diverse suppliers, I think, as was mentioned earlier, uh, are able to offer innovative solutions. They are offer, able to offer cost-effective solutions. So I think that helps the corporations. But then I think it, it filters into the society because as diverse suppliers, we become the conduits of, of opportunities for other diverse individuals. I think we have been very fortunate to have the opportunities that the door was opened that we could get in. But I think it's our obligation to take others with us through that door. And I think that's where I think the society benefits is that there are opportunities for our diverse uh, uh, people to come in and be part of the organization. And then also I think if, if you look at it from the economy standpoint, I mean if you look at how the, grow, uh, the economy grew from 2009 to 2017, that big part of the growth was growth of small diverse businesses because the programs that were put in place with President Obama. And I think that's the power of diversity. And at the end of the day, it gets back to the federal government as well, because for every $100 that the federal government spends on diverse suppliers as part of Tier 1, that $40 comes back to the federal government as tax money. But as opposed to large businesses, only 20 to 25% of that comes back. So I think for the federal government as well, there's incentive because a lot of that money and then the diverse suppliers, they typically are the biggest spenders as well. They give, so they don't just hoard that money, they give it back. So I think as an overall, this diversity, the, I like this initiative of um, uh, uh, FCC, I think in terms of encouraging diversity because I think it has a, a uh, effect more than beyond an individual. I think it, it leverages the entire society and entire ecosystem to really t take the society forward. Good point. Nina? Can I just say what he said? Sure. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I, I love what he has to say, and all that is true. My, you know, my, my answer is, is very, very simple. Um, it's about business, and it's about creating a better America. It's not about the color of your skin. It's not about being a man or a woman. It's about everybody having the opportunity to bring their best self to this country and then collectively grow the country to become a better America. I really believe that. Uh, the McKinsey, McKinsey and Company came out with a study recently that talked about, we all know that small businesses have been the fuel to the American economy for time immemorial. These small businesses have become big businesses and now household names, but they start somewhere. McKinsey did a study recently that said, having a small business owner in a family increases, increases um, the income of a family by 148%. In the African American community, it goes up by 800%. In the Hispanic community, it goes up by 400%. If you are creating wealth, then you are growing America. And so for me, it's literally that simple. I can pick on women uh, because I happen to be one. There are 10.6 million women-owned businesses in the United States. Less than 2% of them are over a million dollars. What Ms. Jan Halroyd has done is unprecedented. She serves as a role model to me and to many others. And role models matter because you can't be 
what you can't see. And so for, for me, it's, it hasn't been just about building a business. Um, that's only half the story. The other half the story is building a better country and building a better opportunity for others. Um, and you know, you can, you can talk or you can talk the talk or you can talk about real actions. And in this moment, it's, it, it comes to mind um, the relationship that we've created with Comcast. Uh, we want a very strategic partnership, a very strategic role with Comcast, and I, I have to congratulate the Comcast team for having the courage and division to include diversity in a very strategic role in their company. But as a result of that, we are now starting accelerators. We are now starting, it doesn't stop with the business coming to us. We've created accelerators to open doors of opportunity for companies like us. We're mentoring companies like us, and I'm proud to say that Pinnacle itself spends over $100 million with women and minority-owned companies. So it's not just about um, words, it's about actions. Thank you. Chris? Well, it's really hard to follow these two. I, they, I think they've, they've hit a, a lot, but I, I'm gonna piggyback on some of the, the things that Nina really mentioned, uh, because I really see, at least for the communities I work with, it really helps improve economic conditions, and, and, and specifically in rural areas. So, so building on uh, what Nina had mentioned, some of the statistics, if you look in our rural communities, uh, creating 10 jobs, creating 15 jobs, creating 100 jobs, and a lot of communities where there's no jobs or very high unemployment, I think is very important, and having that diverse supply chain uh, is, all, you know, is, is part of that as an economic driver. I also see, see uh, the, the growth of wealth, and, and we say that especially in the most, uh, you know, I, I don't like to say underserved communities, uh, but, but uh, communities that are often distressed in areas, again, where, uh, you know, having, a, having s small businesses that are diverse uh, creates that wealth growth and community development. Uh, and, and I also think, too, it's not only, uh, you know, having a suppliers, the diverse suppliers is, is good for the small business, but it's also good for, for the prime and the federal government so that they can see the, the, uh, the whole, um, you know, see, see the diversity of the United States and, and how that, that goes uh, from rural North Carolina, where I grew up, all the way to downtown here in Washington, D.C. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah, uh, my comment is going to even be more short uh, than, um, than, uh, than off, <laughs> just because uh, Prince, Nina, Chris has stated it all. Um, as it relates to um, you know, some of the uh, stats out there, um, I'm a living example as it relates to those specific stats. Um, in the 80s, uh, my father's one of the founders of the uh, National Automobile Minority Dealer Association. And through that, um, he uh, supported increasing the number of uh, diverse automobile dealers throughout the, the country. And um, for me, uh, that impacted um, how I'm going to operate going forward. Uh, so it's become a balancing act, not just to be an entrepreneur, but to also give back and to, to champion diversity for us all. Um, so it, along with that, in terms of the stats uh, that Prince Anita talked about, you know, talked about, um, you know, um, uh, it's we are a stimulus package essentially as small businesses. Um, in, the, in this country. We hire more than even Fortune 500 companies, what have you. So with that, um, it is about business, and at the same time, it's, a, it's about impacting our communities. And, uh, and through that, uh, there's the mentorship, um, and, and, and not only that, but when it comes down to uh, um, impacting our communities, it's about transparency um, associated with organizations on, on how they um, do business with diverse companies and shining that light on what they do. Um, you know, just like Nina said, this is really about building sustainable economic growth. Our economy doesn't work unless we all have a seat at the economic table to thrive and grow. Uh, diverse owned businesses, they pay taxes, they create jobs. Uh, in 2016, we found that LGBT owned businesses, they're an estimated 1.4 million in the US, that they contribute 1.7 trillion annually to the US economy. That would be the 10th largest economy in the world. That's not an insignificant number. D adding these businesses will drive competition, lower prices for taxpayers, and allow all diverse communities to have a seat at the table. And as Nita said, and Prince, as you said, that American dream is invaluable. That's attainable, but it's also important, and that's part of who we are as Americans. And on a global scale, 
we need to continue to encourage this beyond our borders. So before I even begin my comments, I just want to say uh, to Chris, uh, it's nice to have another rural North Carolinian um, here. Uh, I, I say that both on behalf of myself as well as Mrs. Howard, we're both from rural North Carolina, and I think that just goes even further to show, like you said, you know, what economic development and entrepreneurship can do um, with increasing the plight of, of you know, mobility um, in, in life. And, and I think all of the um, panelists thus far have, have really hit to the importance of why supplier diversity matters as it relates to helping the economy and the, the government. Um, but I would like to, to point out two different points, and, and those two points are going to be innovation and inclusion. Two words that I think are um, sometimes overly used as buzzwords in, in the corporate space, but, but let me drill a little bit deeper as it relates to those two words. Innovation. When you're talking to these large uh, corporations, talking about why you can add value to their organization and why they should partner with a smaller organization like yourself, it's important that you outline how you can truly be innovative. Not just using the buzzword, but there are many, many cases where small um, organizations and small businesses, because you are so small, you are nimble, you're agile, you, you, can, you can move and maneuver and you can create things that those large organizations either don't have the time to, don't want to put the money behind, but then you come into the room, uh, like Nina was saying, and, and you present your package and they're like, wow, okay, well we can get it from a minority supplier instead of having to build it in-house, right? So that's the first thing, innovation. Provide that value and truly be innovative. Don't just go in dropping the buzzword or putting it on your cap statement. Um, and the second word is inclusion. The reason why I think inclusion is so important in supplier diversity um, is because from a business perspective, it's important to have someone um, at the table who can speak about the African American communities, the Latino communities, the Indian and Native American communities, the, the LGBT communities, because if we're not there, who's going to speak on our behalf? Um, before coming to the Act One group, I, I did similar work at Google Incorporated, and we had the mindset that we need the people that look like us in our company and in our supplier uh, diversity pipeline in order to be able to create products that could service those, uh, those, those communities and those populations. So what I would do is challenge each of you is to create your value add, create your value proposition around how you can create inclusion and innovation for the people that you're meeting with. Thank you, all great points. Um, Based on a couple of things you all said, I want to ask you all a two-part question. You can answer any order you want. One is the importance of role models, which I think Nina mentioned, but also something I think I discussed with Sabrina back and forth, um, and folks have mentioned here as well, um, with Ms. Allen, who I'll call out again. I'm not sure if she stepped out for a second, but she's excellent at connecting folks across different ethnicities, colors, whatever. How important is cross, let's say, segmentation in terms of moving ahead and moving forward for diverse suppliers. So one, the role model question, and then two, cross-segmentation. How important are those two things? And, um, do you want to go first, take that first? Sure, uh, I'll start with that. First and foremost, um, I'll actually answer your question um, in reverse. The, it, it's incredibly important to, to um, work cross-functionally and across segments. The reason being is because as you continue to grow as an organization, it's so important that you have people in other industries that you can go meet with, that you can share ideas with, and that can often turn into um, business opportunities and strategic partnerships. Um, because similar to the supplier diversity pipeline and how you can provide value to an organization um, because they don't want to do it themselves or it may cost too much, uh, the reality it is you may not always have the full solution, but you may be able to partner with someone in a different industry um, where together with those two capability statements, with those two uh, sets of past performance, you can say, okay, together as a joint venture, we can accomplish a whole lot more. Um, to the first part of the question, the importance of role models. Um, I, I think that goes without saying that, you know, we all have role models, right? Whether it is our, our parents or a very successful uh, business owner or executive all the way to, you know, maybe even a, a sports uh, athlete or something of that sort. Um, 
So I think it's incredibly important, but again, not to go off script here, but if I can just dig a little bit deeper there and say it's not only just important to have role models, but it's incredibly important to also um, break that into two pieces that I like to call mentors and advocates. And I, I think so often people, again, use these words interchangeably and um, use them so heavily that they become you know, desensitized uh, in a manner. But the reason why I want to break the word role model into those two pieces is because an advocate and a role, I'm sorry, an advocate and um, a mentor are two different people, right? That mentor is that person that's going to take you under their wing and they're going to have those honest conversations with you and say, okay, this is what it takes for you to move forward. Okay, this is what you're doing wrong. Okay, don't do that again. Make sure you get it right the next time, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas that advocate is that person who can not only do that, but they are willing to evangelize you when, when it comes to sitting around the table, in the boardroom, in meetings, um, wherever that they have a voice where they can champion you. So I encourage everyone in the room to, to not only have role models, but to make sure that, that you put those people into buckets around those people who can truly mentor and guide you, um, but the others who can also advocate for you and help push you to the next level um, in ways that maybe you can't do yourself. I would say at NGLCC, it's, oh, I'm sorry. No. Uh, it's, uh, for us, you know, we, we, we've uh, created the NGLC mentorship program where we're pairing uh, some of our more junior level certified businesses that maybe have come in in the past few years uh, with corporate mentors who can really walk them through the do's and don'ts of, of how to use their certification and what's important for certification. Um, and understanding, and I always say this, um, that your certification as a, as a diverse owned business, as an LGBT owned business, uh, that's like a gym membership right? You're, you're going to get a return on the investment if you keep going. So you have to take advantage of all the opportunities that are there for you as a diverse supplier. Having a mentor in that, both from a business standpoint and from a corporate standpoint, is so important in your development as a supplier. And on the cross-segment piece, um, and GLCC convened the National Business Inclusion Consortium about seven years ago. Um, that's us. We connect international. We bank. And hi, Pam. I see you back there. Uh, the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, U.S. Black Chambers, Inc., um, and U.S. BLN, the U.S. Business Leadership Network for Disability at Work. Um, and the idea is when we all work together, when we understand that not every priority we might align on, uh, align on but they are priorities for us nonetheless, we can strengthen our voices together. We know that LGBT people aren't just LGBT people, they're women, they're people of color, they're persons with disabilities. And so for us, it's very important to also look at our mentorship and our alignment of priorities from that angle as well. Good point. Um, well, yeah. I guess I'll just go down the row. So yes. yeah. Yeah. As a small business owner, uh, mentorship is very important. Uh, it's, it's important in as much as uh, that mentorship piece is, is two components. One, uh, identifying the right mentor. Um, and that mentor, I really, I break it up to, into two types of mentor. One type of mentor is a mentor outside of your industry uh, that has a proven track record of success. Um, and then secondly, identifying a mentor within your industry, uh, especially uh, it would be really nice to identify a mentor within an organization you want to do business with. And so essentially with that mentorship piece, they, they afford you the blueprint um, to show you the way to success. Um, and with that, you know, they support you with mitigating the risk associated with strategy and growth, um, you know, access to relationships, and even possibly uh, capital. Um, so in, in some respects, uh, these mentors, um, internal uh, corporate mentors, uh, co-sign on you, so to speak, to say, this organization gets it. Uh, they've done their homework. Mm -hmm. uh, the second piece as relates to the uh, cross-segmentation. Well, I mean, it's important because it's about sharing of information. Um, most of us, and I've seen this uh, in the business, being a diverse organization, we do not share information, and so it's and, and so that's critical. And um, you know, your, your growth uh, will jump by leaps and bounds. Uh, sharing of those res uh, those resources uh, associated with that speaks to um, identifying leadership within your organization, people to hire um, towards your core business, um, and uh, along with that, in terms of uh, these uh, you know, cross segmentation speaks to teaming and partnering. Um, and so through that, it gives you an opportunity to do a SWOT analysis, if you will, uh, to um, identify synergies between organizations that you want to partner with. Thanks. Chris? I think uh, Charles and I, our notes are exactly the same. Oh. So I was just like, I was reading. Yeah, I could tell <laughs> you're reading my stuff. 
Uh, but just to piggyback on it, uh, I'm just joking. That, but but I, I, I totally agree a lot with Charles, what he said. Um, you know, one is uh, we'll talk on the teaming, the ability to do that gap analysis and, and to really see what your company has to offer and then looking at a team player that maybe offers a, com uh, you know, a similar similar but something that you don't have in your company that you can go after uh, a larger contract together. Uh, the joint venture uh, as well as, as having, you know, um, having a joint venture and having a mentor to maybe even as I, the panel before us had mentioned each one of those, they had different types of programs and there oftentimes are opportunities for a joint venture with a large prime company like that to uh, go after business. It sounds like that's happened on this panel as well. Uh, and I, I, I do have to touch base on what Charles has said about the importance of choosing that right mentor is, is so important. I myself, a lot of times, I would not be necessarily a, a good mentor. Uh, not that I don't have you know, the, the education, but I just, I just don't have the time. I don't have uh, the patience and understanding. Not that I won't eventually. So uh, a lot of times people look at me and they say, oh, well, you know, obviously he's, he would be, but uh, you know, I wouldn't because of just my own, my own capacity of, of the restraints of time and what with my own company. So, um, you know, people have to be realistic on that and sometimes don't, uh, you know, understand people's capacity when they're looking for um, the mentor, make sure it's a right fit for you. Cool, thanks. Um, Nina. So as I mentioned before, you cannot be what you cannot see or hashtag see it, be it. Mm -hmm. But um, this is something that actually my parents told me <laughs> in life, you know. In life, pick your role models mm -hmm. and then emulate what they do. And so in the spirit of giving my fellow minority-owned businesses a piece of advice on kind of the strategies that I used or the tactics, tangible things that they could take home is, you know, AT&T had a lot to do with this. I think they saw in us, um, bef they saw in us a potential before we even saw it in ourselves. Not everybody can be a customer. When we joined the Women's Business Council, we were a $1 million company. Uh, five years before we became a supplier at AT&T, they weren't a supplier to us. They were a mentor. They said, hey, we have a seat at our table at the Women's Business Council. Hey, we have a seat over here. They didn't give us business, but they gave us a seat at the table. They gave us an opportunity to go and meet people and establish credibility. Verizon did the same thing. We met them at the Women's Business Council, and we gave, they gave us the opportunity to bid on a project, and then we lost it. And then they gave us another opportunity to bid, and they mentored us through the program. Here's what you're doing wrong, if you're willing to ask the question. And that is so important as a small business. It's not about winning every deal. We've probably lost more than we've won. <laughs> it's about winning the right deal. And so to my fellow minority business owners, there's a lot of patience involved. It's about building relationships. It's about finding those role models. It's about utilizing these companies that are up here. They may not be customers day one, but they certainly can be of value. To your question about um, working with other communities, uh, what Susan Allen has done is quite frankly the definition of leadership. She knows that she has her Asian, her, her Asian entrepreneurs that are looking for business. And it doesn't have to be directly with a household name. I went, I had the pleasure and privilege of going to the US Pan-Asian Gala, where lots of Pinnacle suppliers were there. She understands that when she communicates and goes across communities, it's about business. It's about getting business done, and that's how she advocates. And so I'm really, um, I really believe in that. I believe that not every, we should stop looking at ourselves as a color or a gender. We should look at ourselves as the human potential that we have, and how can we together collectively accomplish our goals. Not every mentor of mine is Hispanic. I'm proud to have a lot of Hispanic um, mentors, but they're women, they're men. And it's important for us to keep in mind to not become a self-fulfilling prophecy, to be only about women for women, only for women, only about Hispanics for Hispanics. You know, the best advocates for the advancement of women in America are quite frankly men. They really are. And if we don't invite other communities to the table, if we don't invite 
men to advocate for women, African Americans to advocate for Hispanics, Asians to advocate for GLBT, we're missing out on a great opportunity. Thanks. To add to what Nina just said, I mean, Susan, I mean, um, she has been a great mentor. I'll tell you, I mean, when we were looking to build an Internet of Things, machine-to-machine -machine communications network, um, and we needed a big company to kind of um, support us on that, Susan connected me with the chief procurement officer and CEO of Pepsi. That type of connection doesn't come very easy, and the fact that she was able to connect me means a lot. I mean, I, I had the privilege of going with her to the China trade mission and to have the kind of the leaders from large Fortune 100 companies there and you are with them uh, because Susan was there. I think that's, that opportunity comes because of mentors. I think personally from my experience, kind of in, in our uh, family, nobody has ever done business. Mm -hmm. And um, back when kind of I, I decided to go with business, it was because I felt that there was a need in the marketplace because all the public safety agencies are an island by themselves. What I mean by that is they could communicate very well within their jurisdiction, but they could not, mm -hmm. God forbid it was a major disaster, they could not communicate across jurisdictions. That was a problem I wanted to solve. Mm -hmm. And um, nine months later, um, fortunately, unfortunately, kind of 9-11 uh, happened and we were thrust into the public safety um, forum kind of from that perspective. But I did not have a good mentor until five years later. That's when I realized the importance. So company grew but did not grow very well. But once I found the mentor, the business of, over the next three years, we were on Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing company for the next five years, we're the fastest growing telecom company. And that would not have been possible had not I not had mentor. And I, I'll talk to you about um, kind of communities, kind of. I mean, so um, two, three years ago, we came across an opportunity with Department of Interior. They have this big three billion dollar contract. They want to let out on field communications, and um, there's no way we could have done it by ourselves. Mm -hmm. But we put together a team of 14 companies, and some of them, half of them, are multi billion dollar companies. Half of them are small businesses, and we went after that contract. Um, we're right now kind of in negotiations with Department of Interior competing against other multi-billion dollar companies to, to win that contract. And that would not have possible if, number one, we had built that community and kind of go in as kind of a pool of businesses that can go and take down the opportunity. And then number two, I want to give credit to Andrew Bostock, who's here, who kind of put together the whole strategy in terms of how we can go after and win a truly a game changer contract for our company. And that is the power of collaborating across businesses because even though you are small businesses, now be, by collaborating, you're really much bigger than you are. Mm -hmm. Good points, thanks. And you made um, aw awesome points, man. This is great. I wish I could you know, write it down, but it's being recorded so you can watch it later. Um, but a couple points that I really want to focus on is one, uh, the opportunity to be your best selves. I think a lot of folks don't have the opportunity, so I think it's great that we mentioned that. Um, and also the cross-segmentation, so to speak. It's so important that folks advocate for other folks. I always tell people, you know, they say, well, when you raise your kids, what did you do? That They're good kids. Well, I think they're good kids, but anyway. Uh, I told them that one thing I tried to focus on with my children specifically is that they advocate and hang out with and work with good people. And I think too often times we get into our little bubbles, whether it's whatever bubble you want to term it as, and, and become focused on that and don't reach out and branch out and work with other people. Because there are lots of good folks of all shades and colors and sizes, but if you restrict yourself to one little area, you'll never get to that point. Um, piggybacking off of that, what challenges specifically do you all find that diverse suppliers encounter? Well, I mean, like I said, I mean, I think when I started out, I did not um, have kind of I mean, any understanding of the business. So I think learning the business was probably the biggest challenge. Um, but, I mean, I think in terms of pursuing the business, I mean, I'll tell you kind of when I, when I was growing up and I used to come home and complain to my mom, mom, I can't do this, I can't do this because these guys are there and these guys are there. And um, my mom used to say this, is be so good, they can't ignore you. I'll repeat it again, be so good, they can't ignore you. And I'll, I'll, Oprah Winfrey had this um, uh, quote that the excellence is the greatest deterrent to discrimination. Excellence is the greatest deterrent to discrimination. And that's why as a company, we have invested in making sure that we are really the best in the industry. 
terms of making sure that we have the ISO 9001 certification, making sure we have a TL 9000 certification, making sure that we are, uh, each of our managers is Six Sigma certified. So, so when we come across to our customers, they say, by God, this is the best telecom business that we want to do business with. That's what I want people to, when they have interaction with Comdex, so that's why I kind of, as a company, we have grown, not because we were good at sales or marketing and all this stuff, because we were good at what we did, and we know what our niche is. Our niche is public safety communications. That's what we are good at. That's where we are the best in the business side. That's why we have done business in all 50 states across the country, because, and to me, I think if you are best at what you, what you are, then people will seek you out. And that, I think, is, um, has been my personal experience. Along the way, kind of, I think, another thing I, I would share as well is the conscious decision that I took was that I will never borrow money from anybody else. We have been profitable each and every year for the last 17 years in business. Because, and, and because of that, we have been debt-free along the way, kind of making sure that we grow the business responsibly so that during those times when business downturn does happen, I don't, I'm not losing my sleep because I know that I don't owe money to anybody else. That has been my advice to Edward Simon. Don't go out, do it, grow just for the sake of growing, mm -hmm. but grow because it is the right thing to do. Yeah, cool, thanks. Nina? It's not surprising that we have the same values and a very similar story. And so I just, when I talk to entrepreneurs across the country, I, I tell them to be crazy good at what they do. I tell them to be crazy good at what they do. I use the crazy good hashtag all the time. And I use it not just for entrepreneurs, I use it for students. I use it anytime I possibly can because that's how you build that credibility and that reputation. And that reputation, particularly when you're a small business, goes a long way. I think back 15 years ago when Pinnacle was really small. A lot of, raise your hand if you have an extra $250,000 for marketing. And so what we did is we decided strategically to be so good at what we did, to leverage our strengths, to deliver consistently for our customers, and to partner with organizations that really want to see us succeed. The U.S. Pan-Asian Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Women's Business Council, the NMSDC, all these are platforms. They're platforms that want to see you succeed, and they're platforms that will tell your story. And so if you can become a magnet, this is an incredible way to become a magnet to your customers and future customers. So in the context and in the spirit of giving advice, you know, these are some tactical things that you can do is be really involved in these councils, be really involved, not just by the membership, but get involved, take a leadership role, distinguish yourself, be crazy good at what you do, um, and, and because to answer your question fully, we'd be here the next two hours. There's lots of challenges that minority businesses have, and there's, you know, a lot of them are similar to just businesses in general. But the way that you interact those challenges, I have to agree with Prince, is through excellence. Thanks. Chris. Uh, and and I, I really like uh, what Prince was saying, you know, knowing your niche, you know, really knowing what, what your you know, what you're good at and really excel at that. Uh, but I see sometimes when, and, and again, it goes back to what Nina said, it's not just my, it's not just diverse businesses, but it's also a lot of all small businesses. Where I, where I look at companies, um, if I put out any type of solicitation for work, and this is what I do now or in my past, one of the first things I, I look up the company on the website. And, you know, if I can't get the information uh, quickly for what I'm looking for, I, I'm probably going to move that move on. And, and so, you know, my advice to a lot of companies, you know, promotions, and that's making sure that, that me as a buyer possibly one day, or, or one of the big companies as a buyer, they, they know your capacity, they know, you know, what, what your company is, what it does, if you're doing government contracts and the the uh, contracting officers looking at those companies, they, they need to know what type of industry codes you have. Uh, and, and some of those things are, are really easy to keep up to date. And, and just you just have to keep everything, and that's small business dynamic business search, your SAMs, um, and, and making sure that you have a good marketing and promotions, if that's a website, if that's active on social media, um, you, you know, make sure that you have a plan. 
And, and then lastly, what I see a lot of times with our companies, uh, the panel before us talked about their matchmaking events. I know that, that we all probably, the, the, the trade associations, we do matchmaking events. Uh, probably I do 15 of them around the country. And where I see is so many businesses uh, miss those opportunities is they'll get to that one-on-one -on -one meeting. They have 15 minutes to sell their pitch and they don't know what, what to say. And, and I think that all goes back to promoting yourself as a company. And e even though you may be able to, to do everything I need, if you're not able to articulate that and not able to tell me that, then unfortunately, um, you know, we're, we're going to move on. So, John? I just want to quickly say this. Uh, based on uh, the comments by the panelists, uh, Prince Nina, we're going to cross pollinate. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely do that after the, but nevertheless, in terms of the, the challenges, um, four, four things. Um, not, you know, it, our first challenge would be not becoming uh, good at, you know, what we do or one thing. Um, and with that, it's becoming a subject matter expert. You become a, a SME within your, your space. Um, and with that, it speaks to what you were talking about, Nina. Um, we've been pouring more of our resources into operations. And um, even to your point, Prince, um, as it relates to certifications. Um, right now, we, we're, we're working with uh, BizFix, which is one of the organizations, a woman-based firm, for getting our ISO 91000 TL 9000 certification and what have you. So, I mean, with all that, um, you, we, we also uh, work closely with MSDC, or C Chicago's Minority Supply Development Council, other organizations that are similarly situated that will tell our story as we continue to grow our business. Um, Along with that, uh, we talk about becoming a subject matter expert. Uh, a number of us, we do not create a value proposition, you know, really what distinguishes our organization from others. I think that's critical. Um, ultimately, businesses, um, large organizations, what they want is they, they, they would like a diverse organization to inject their products and services into the supply chain, but they want um, uh, you to really become a part of their quote unquote value chain. Um, services uh, that you render the impact uh, their core business um, that uh, what I mean by that is direct services um, that um, will impact their EBITDA uh, while at the same time increase uh, workforce uh, productivity this is critical um, the other piece in terms of challenges is that we don't have per se the, the relationship so that's tied into um, the organizations uh, that uh, Nina was talking about um, and then lastly would be you know, through that, that access to capital. And that's a critical piece, and that, that's where that mentorship and things of that nature will uh, afford you the, the right path uh, to grow your business from a financial standpoint. Thanks. Sabrina? I'm glad that we all prepared our notes together. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, number one, yes, access to capital. That's obviously huge for any small business. I think uh, business owners are probably the most courageous people I've ever met. Um, to put your whole self on the line, your livelihood for an idea, um, and to manifest that into reality is something huge. Um, and so with that, something that I often tell our businesses who get certified with us, don't just look at that one corporate contact, uh, contract as being your means to success. There is so much more than just getting that one, three, four, five million dollar contract and above. You know, not all businesses are going to be scaled to that level. Understand that you have resources and a network within your diverse business community. And we touched on this before. It's not just, you know, LGBT-owned businesses working with LGBT-owned businesses. It's LGBT-owned businesses working with Pan-Asian-owned businesses, person of color-owned businesses. Um, the, those building of connections and, again, strengthening that network is so important. And you might not get a contract from that first conversation, from that very first uh, conference that you attend. But it's recognizing your face in that space and being able to articulate your value proposition. What differentiates you in this marketplace from all the other suppliers that may seemingly look like you from the outside? Okay. So um, I, what I wanted to talk about is, you know, you, you asked the question about challenges. Mm -hmm. And first and foremost, I want to tell um, the, the suppliers that are in the room that, that no matter what size you are, no matter how much you grow, there will always be challenges, right? Um, the Act One Group, we are now a multi-billion dollar company, but guess what? We still have challenges. 
because when we are competing against our publicly traded competitors, um, because of our size now, there are many people in the large corporations um, that are saying, can Act One really handle the business? Oh, can, uh, well, maybe we should go with their publicly traded competitor. Well, I don't want us to just talk about challenges today. I want us to talk about some solutions to these things too. And one thing that I want to say about as it relates to sometimes the door being closed in your face or being told that you're too small or not yet. Not yet doesn't mean no, okay? So a delay is not a denial is what I like to say. But instead, I do believe that those are opportunities for us to take a step back and say, okay, well, what can I do for you? Now, now let me pause there because I know you just heard me say, ask what can I do for you? That does not at all mean be all things to everyone. Like Nina and Prince have already said, no, you need to be great at what you do. But the reason why I say find something that's in your wheelhouse that you can start small with that organization is how you break down that barrier to entry within that organization. Case in point, um, there have been some organizations that, that we are bidding on or that we're in the room with, and they say, oh, well, well we're, we're not going to give you the whole package. Well, then that's when we turn and say, okay, well, if you don't want to give us all the workforce solutions, then give us the staffing. Or you should use our background checking and credentialing company. Or maybe you use our technology and you give uh, the staffing to someone else, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm saying is, is if you can't get all the way in the door the first time, that doesn't mean that you can't break it down to something smaller to the way you can add value, prove yourself, and then go back and say, okay, I've proven to you that I can deliver. I've proven to you that, that we have the capital to be uh, financially solvent while, main, while uh, servicing your business. Now can we have more? Um, and then another thing that I wanted to hit on um, that, that, that Nina shared, she was talking about AT&T and how they guided her and mentored her. And I think that's so important because one of our, actually our largest client today um, has purchased every service and, and product that we've ever taken to market. And to be quite honest with you, some of those products and services were the ideas of that particular client because we got in through staffing and then we did well. And then they said, well, gosh, I wish you all could do X, Y, and Z. And then we were able to create that type of offering and continue to grow with them. And that's what I love of the thing that I'm hearing on this panel about not just being a supplier, but be a strategic partner. Because when you're a strategic partner and you're in that room having a conversation, it's much more than saying, what can you do for me? Help me pay my bills, help me grow my company. You're then talking about how can I help solve your problems and how can I grow with you so that we can grow together. Thanks. Um, we're a little bit behind schedule, but we have time for a couple questions. Um, if folks have questions. All right. Introduce yourself, your, uh, your name, who you're with, and your question. Outstanding. So I'm Bill Cunningham. I run uh, minoritifinance.com, creativeinvest.com. Uh, we've been doing this for about 30 years. Uh, we recently, uh, we, we're working in two areas. I'm curious as to your opinions on it. We know that the group that has been creating businesses at the fastest rate is African-American females. All of the data uh, supports that. We also know that according to the surveys that we've done, uh, that their number one concern, number one problem, is certainly access to capital. So there's a video of me talking to a blockchain group, Blockchain for Social Impact in New York. And I talk about the work that we did with a bunch of African-American female hair salon owners, getting them to look at something called Bitcoin. Uh, this was a year ago. We got lucky, right? We said, hey, go buy some Bitcoin. It went up 1,700%, you know. But still, I'm curious as to your approach with respect to some of the new tools, ICOs, Bitcoin, digital currency, blockchain, and how that's going to impact this sector. Thanks. Any takers? I think, I mean, um, uh, there are, and now more than ever, there are a lot of opportunities for you to connect with capital. I mean, there's sites like in, in the Gigo, I guess, and uh, others kind of where you can kind of share your idea and somebody who likes the idea can finance that idea. Uh, but also, I mean, I think um, there are opportunities. I mean, to me, I think the first thing uh, that you need to do as a business is find a customer who's willing to pay because until there's a customer who's willing to pay, you don't have a business. 
you can get all the financing you want. So I think, I mean, like, just like, I mean, you're planting a new seed, I mean, the first thing that seed needs to do is to find the root. If you don't find that root, that source of cash that will kind of sustain life for that seed, it ain't gonna happen. So I think the first thing I uh, um, would recommend is kind of find that seed, find that customer who can sustain that, and then business can go from there. Thank you. Anyone else? So access to cap, yeah. I mean, I don't know if we're all gonna answer it, but m my, my answer would be, you know, access to capital has always been the number one challenge for small businesses for as long as I could remember. Um, and there are, the laws are changing, so Kickstarter and crowdfunding, and now with the new laws changing, there's organizations like GLOW, the Global Leaders Organization that has allowed plat digital platforms where you can actually go and raise money. Um, but I personally, my personal experience is the best way is to reinvest your earnings. And Prince and I went to that same school of thought Absolutely. because for the last 22 years, we reinvest 100% of the earnings back into the company. And that sends a very strong message, not to your bankers, to your customers, but more importantly, to your people, to your biggest asset, which is your people, that you are in this for the long game. You are in this for them. And when you're investing in them, you're investing in their future. Pinnacle would never have been able to make the Inc. 500, 5,000 list for 12 consecutive years. And to be where we are today without that fundamental message, and so I really believe, um, by the way, I take no credit, Pinnacle has been created by the very men and women that are part of our, so, uh, part of our company. And you have to show them, again, not through words, but through actions, that you're in it for the long game. Thanks. And, and I'll just add one more really brief comment. Um, and, and I have to give a, a, a quick shout out to um, the US SBA. Um, and the reason why I want to shout them out is because we're talking about access to capital and all of the people sitting up here on this panel, we, you know, we have conversations about, you know, not just reinvesting our capital, but, but how do we pay it forward? Um, one of the best ways to do that is through the SBA Mentor Protege Program. Um, so for the people in the room who are, are small businesses and are looking to grow, not only find that mentor, but find a mentor company that would be willing to take you under their wing and, and join the, the SBA Mentor Protege program because that not only provides government incentives for you as a small business, but it also provides uh, government incentives to the, the mentoring company. Um, and the Act One Group is very proud um, to be a part of the Mentor Protege program. And, and you know we are helping other small businesses grow by way of that. So make sure that, that you're not only reinvesting your capital into your own company, but reinvest your, your time um, and, and your efforts into other small businesses to help them grow as well. All right, thanks. Um, we could go on and on with this, but I want to keep us not too far off schedule. So what I'm going to do is, if you have any other questions for this panel, if you could give them to Sharon Stewart, who's walking around with um, index cards, I'm going to have the questions emailed to these folks, and then we'll post them on our website, because I don't want to get us too far off schedule. But what I want to do before we leave is to have each participant speak for like 30 seconds as a closing remark, so you can say anything you didn't get to say or emphasize something that you said earlier. And I'll start at this end and work my way back down. Well, again, thank you so much for um, having me as well as the Act One group to participate here today. Um, in the absence of Mrs. Janice Bryant Howroy, my CEO, I'm definitely going to end with one of her quotes, which is, never compromise who you are personally to become who you wish to be professionally. Um, that's something that I really believe, and I think as you continue to grow as entrepreneurs and small businesses, you should definitely keep that with you. Um, but I'll also share one of my own quotes, which is, success is a standard for today, greatness is a goal for tomorrow. And what I mean by that is you're already successful because you're entrepreneurs and because you're here today, but go the next step and be great because being great is what will keep you um, adding value to organizations and keep your business growing. So thank you. All the best to you. And um, thanks again. And thank you once again for having us here. NGLC is really proud to be a part of this conversation. Um, you know, some takeaways from today, I think number one, do not ever underestimate the value of your cross segment diverse business community. I think, number one, make sure that you're out there, you're building context, that you're coming to events like this, both on a local and a national level. USPAC just had their conference last week. WeBank is around the corner in a week and a half. You know, those are really prime spaces for you to be able to meet people that are just like you, to learn from their experiences, and to also grow your business. Um, and last but not least, show up, be present, and know what differenti differentiates you. That's the most important thing that you can do uh, in any sort of business environment. Yep. Again, thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, event. Um, I just want to give 
comments, um, advice to a small, diverse business. Um, number one is start a business uh, if you haven't already started it. Start a business that you love, and if you don't love it, then you need to get out the business. Uh, second, um, select three to four business development or trade organizations, which includes an organization that will assist you becoming a, 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 a SME. Um, also, a uh, third would be create a leadership team and, and keep that leadership team close. And that would be that strong accountant, that, that CPA, and that, that legal counsel. Um, fourth would be um, just to note that it's a balancing act between business development, operations, and, and giving back as a mentor uh, to uh, um, similarly situated organizations that want to be like you. Uh, thank you, everyone, and, and it's really great to be uh, with these, this team of experts today. Um, my takeaway, be prepared. You know, just uh, get ready for that opportunity. You never know if it's going to happen this afternoon during matchmaking, or maybe it's going to happen even, uh, you know, leaving here today. You may run into somebody that has an opportunity for you. So uh, know your business, know your talking points, be prepared to get to the, the next level. Uh, and if you're looking into government contracting, I uh, totally agree with, with the SBA resources, but look, at, look for those resources. Um, know, know the Osdebu's office for each, each agency. Uh, get to know them. Uh, let them know you because I, I would say the forecast between now and the end of the year for the federal government, you're going to see a lot of opportunities coming out. And I mean, they've already, the FCC mentioned already today some of what they're doing, and it's just because they have to spend a lot of the money they have to spend in one year and they have to get it done. So be ready for those opportunities, be ready to team or build or bid upon an opportunity when it comes, uh, comes available. What a privilege to be here today. What an absolute um, honor. As a piece of advice, I, I always tell people that 70% of leadership is just showing up. You never know who you're going to meet in simply showing up and being present. Uh, relationships are everything, but relationships are influenced through your personal credibility. Be crazy good at what you do. Build your brand, your personal credibility, and your company's credibility based on your outcomes and what you're able to deliver. And last but not least, make lots of deposits Make lots of deposits. Make a deposit every day in the bank of relationships. And sometimes that means doing something, expecting nothing in return. I promise you that will come back to you twofold. I promise you that. So I want to thank everyone for being here today. It's a privilege and an honor for me to be here and share just a little bit of my experience in hopes that it will go a long way with you. Well, first of all, Sanford, thank you for this opportunity to be here today. It's, I've really been enlightened to hear this uh, discussion here. Uh, but if there's one word I would, uh, one advice I would give to everybody is dare to dream big. Because dream has this incredible power to pull you. So it's kind of, I look at dream as like being a rubber band. So think of like, this is where you are currently and this is, so you think of a rubber band connecting these two. The more you stretch it, if you keep your dream over here, it's gonna pull you towards it. That's the power of dream. So dream big, but at the same time, Make sure that you have the perseverance and the determination to follow that dream as well. Because pursuing a business, like a steam panelist said, it's not easy. There's, you're going to have struggles along the way. And how you persevere through the struggles is how you, what defines you as a person. Uh, at the end of the day, I think success is business. It's not about how much money you have in the bank, but how much passion you have within you. The success in business, to me, is about I mean, persevering through those struggles, enjoying those triumphs, I mean, taking those risks and enjoying those rewards in the journey of creating something good, something really unique that you can offer to the world. That what I think is fulfilling about running a business and giving back to the world. I think that's, that to me, I think, dare to dream big and don't let anything compromise your dream. Thank that's you, my sir. Sir. Such incredible advice. Um, please thank my panelists for their words of advice for their time, for their energy. I appreciate it. Um, and Estino Patrick has her flyer I mentioned earlier. Um, Hudson Dolly over there, and the flyers are on the table. Um, my quick uh, synopsis would be a takeaway, I guess. Uh, dream big, 
Um, know yourself, be true to yourself, um, be crazy good, be excellent, and invest in relationships. I like the, the relationship part because there are so many times you invest in relationships, and especially if you expect nothing in return, and you never know what will happen and what will come from that. Um, so that, that's great advice. Um, and shout out to Amanda again, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, she's looking for a job at some point, so you know, get to know her. <laughs> Rising star. Um, but uh, next on our agenda, we have lunch. We'll get back here roughly at 1.15 to start our next panel. Then after the panel, we'll have brief closing remarks and then go straight into the one-on-one -on -one consultation. So we're going to start back up again about 1.15, hopefully, and stay on task. And I uh, thank you for your time, and I appreciate it. Good afternoon. I hope you didn't eat too much comfort food and <laughs> so we can continue with this last panel. Um, well, thank you for, for returning to continue these discussions. I hope you uh, enjoyed the morning session as much as I did. I not only learned something myself and uh, we're pretty inspired by some of the panelists who shared their personal stories. Um, so, um, we are going to move to our third panel soon, but before we do, I wanted to uh, circle back and recognize my working group that um, helped to put this together. I, I did mention them in my op opening comments, but I wanted to be on record on the specific individuals who have been key to uh, putting this agenda together in partnership with the FCC staff. So uh, Rudy, you heard from Rudy Brioshi this morning. He's sitting in the back. Rudy uh, is a sub, was a subgroup leader for the deployment uh, subgroup. Donna Epps, Donna Epps was here earlier and she's with Verizon. Uh, Susan Allen, Susan Allen was recognized for her expertise and her, in her, her tremendous years of experience in, in, in helping diverse suppliers. Um, she, is the, she leads the US Pan-Asian uh, Pan American Chamber of Commerce. And as you heard earlier, she advocates for everybody um, who's just a diverse supplier. Laura Burkhol with Charter Communications, Janice Bryant, Harroyd with Act One. Um, she was represented on the second panel, and um, she's a tremendous inspiration and, and a success story for, from, for, um, for us to learn from. Uh, Marie Silla Dixon with T Mobile. She's, is she here? She was here earlier. Uh, Laura. There you are. Oh, yes. <laughs> Say hi. <laughs> uh, S. Janelle Trick with Lehman Center, sitting right in front of us. She's also a tremendous inspiration for us, and um, uh, she she was happy to be here and um, has been uh, dealing with a with a, a, a family uh, health crisis. So appreciate you taking time to be here. Um, Susan, we were just talking about you. We were just talking about how awesome you are. <laughs> we were talking about you, and we gave you additional work to do. So <laughs> we gave you another position. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for being an inspiration and, and all your years of working in supplier diversity. Um, so that is the, the members of my subgroup that have been um, really pivotal to getting this together. So if you can take a second and give them a hand, I'd really appreciate it. Okay, I think we have all our panelists together. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our third panel, and that is the Toolkit for Doing Business Supplier Certification and, and Beyond panel. 
It's moderated by Carolyn Fleming Williams, and she is the Senior Deputy Director of OCPO here at FCC. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We enjoyed a very exciting and informative uh, session this morning with our two panels. And um, I may say that we've saved the best for last, but certainly uh, equally as exciting and informative as this morning's session. So we look forward to hearing from each of you. Uh, as Heather mentioned, uh, panel three is a toolkit for success. So we want to give our suppliers uh, information on the tools, resources, skills, strategies, et cetera, that they should pack in their toolkit in order to be successful as entrepreneurs. I'll tell you, I'll start by uh, giving a brief background on our office here, the Office of Communications and Business Opportunities. Our office is charged with recommending policies as well as implementing small business statutes within the FCC. Um, we wear a number of different hats, both on the regulatory side and on the outreach side. Uh, so events like this are important to us because we get to have the real world um, information that will influence our policy making and policy recommendations. So it's very critical for us. We learn something as well. Uh, we'll begin briefly with, uh, with brief introductions from our panelists, and we'll start at the end of the table with Pamela Prince Eason. Hello, everyone. Is this on? Okay. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here with you today. I am the president and CEO of the Women's Business Enterprise National Council. As you heard from earlier panelists today, many of our uh, certifying organizations collaborate, like mine and Susan's, and, and uh, as well as uh, Sharon in the NMSDC. Uh, so I'm glad to be here to represent women, uh, as you heard from other people. Um, women can be LGBT, women can be of color, women can be disabled, etc. And so it's a great honor to be here with you and to talk about what you need in your toolkit and the great work that's being done here. You're welcome. Sharon? Good afternoon. I'm Sharon Pender, and I'm President and CEO of the Capital Region Minority Supply Development Council. And the CRMSDC, as we're known, is one of 23 affiliates of the National Minority Supply Development Council. It's located, headquartered in New York. We're actually headquartered here um, in the DMV. And so our territory includes the state of Maryland, the District of Columbia, and Northern Virginia. And so our core product is around certification and certifying minority businesses for the private sector. The other um, thing that goes hand in hand, in, of course, with that is providing resources to help build capacity for those businesses. I also want to mention we have two other assets um, that uh, belong to the Capital Region Minority Spot Development Council. We have um, two MBDA centers that we operate, the MBDA um, from the U.S. Department of Commerce um, Center for Washington, D.C., and we also have the only federal procurement center um, funded by Department of Commerce that operates um, under our umbrella as well. Thank you. Maureen? Good afternoon, and thank you, Carolyn and OCBO, for this opportunity to engage in this important discussion. My name is Maureen Lewis. I'm the Director of Minority Telecommunications Development at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. It's a mouthful for a small agency within the Commerce Department, <laughs> but um, and we are one of the smaller agencies. And let me just say at the outset that I am on the domestic policy staff. So my role really is to help engage minority and small business stakeholders around policy making. And so I'm going to talk a little bit today both about NTIA and commerce, and some of the remarks that I will share with you are applicable to the larger federal government. So you've heard the old saying, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. In <laughs> fact, <laughs> we're all here to help, and thank you so much for having me today. Susan? And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Susan L. Allen, the national president and the chief executive officer of the U.S. Pan-Asian American Chamber of Commerce. We celebrated a 33rd anniversary last week. Um, uh, of um, uh, an organization that aspires to serve the very diverse Pan-Asian American business community in the United States. There are about 48 subgroups in our community, 
speaking above 100 languages, and many of them are still newcomers. So our organization has our work cut out for us. Uh, what we do, we connect, open doors, connect, nurture, and help to grow Asian American businesses, which are very unique by, by themselves, and um, uh, we pride ourselves in helping them get into the mainstream, stay in the mainstream, and grow and sustain their growth. Uh, we do that, and we do it very well, and I look forward to sharing my experiences with you. Thank you. Major? Well, I asked to go last. Yes. And <coughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not sure about the best. I'm, I'm actually here because a, a warrior out there in the field uh, contacted me when I was on the operating table and asked me to be here, and that was uh, uh, S. Janelle Triggs. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, <coughs> I think I said yes. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, I, and I'm here, but um, I'm actually here. Uh, I see the tag, it says U.S. Small Business Administration. Uh, I actually uh, uh, work for an entity that's actually uh, independent of SBA, and I'll explain that later on, but uh, the Office of Advocacy uh, was created uh, in the 19, uh, 1979 by Congress to be an independent voice for small business, and uh, that independent voice as uh, it requires us to be uh, to be an advocate uh, for small businesses as they uh, pursue opportunities within uh, the federal government and I'll talk a little bit more about what that uh, uh, advocacy really entails um, uh, Carolyn said people were listening wanting to make sure uh, know about money we don't have any money uh, so anyone who has a question to me, I can tell you about SBA's money programs, but the Office of Advocacy uh, is without money. Uh, we do uh, have uh, some money in terms of uh, research opportunities, and I'll talk a little bit more about the, that uh, going forward. But uh, our primary goal is to, to be your voice uh, before uh, the federal agencies and uh, We've done that pretty well, uh, pretty well over the years, and I'll talk about some of the things that we've done. Uh, I also come here with a different hat, and um, that different hat is that um, some years ago, uh, in the 1980s, uh, I worked for a member of Congress, uh, Congressman Perrin Mitchell, and we were in the middle of, of fighting for uh, small and minority business uh, issues, and FCC was, uh, was on the top of our list uh, of things that we wanted to do in terms of uh, trying to uh, expand opportunities for small and minority businesses uh, in the telecommunication and in the communication area. So I'm not only interested in wanting to talk to you about what should be in your toolkit and toolbox, but asking you what you think you need to have in your toolkit and toolbox as we move forward. Great. So let's get started. Um, as it has been said in data, supports, small businesses are the engine of the economy. So I'd like each of you to speak of on the specific programs and resources that you offer either as a government agency or as a nonprofit that uh, is available to small businesses to enhance or maintain, improve their businesses um, and to be able to be competitive within the supplier diversity chain. And I'll, again, start with Pamela. Um, your mission is to fuel global economic growth. Yes. So again, within that context, what are some of the specific resources that you have to offer? Okay, so the Women's Business Enterprise National Council began um, its purpose as a certifying organization. Uh, primarily, large corporations were looking to have valid um, validity around businesses that were owned, operated, and controlled by women. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as part of that activity, the, the certification quickly became something that you needed to have um, it provided validity. Um, it helped you to ensure that you had everything in place. And it, be it began to provide you the opportunity to meet uh, corporations who were interested in doing business with small business, with women-owned businesses, et cetera. Um, from that, though, it grew to a mission that was much broader than that, which is absolutely we certify. We are the best certifier of women-owned businesses. And we do that very well and do that every day. 
what we're really focused on now is growing those businesses and making sure that we're training those owners so that they have the same opportunities as anyone who worked in a large corporation where the funds were available to make sure that they could train and market and develop their businesses. So we primarily do this in a, in a two-fold two -fold manner with the exception of we're always communicating what's available via the Small Business Administration or other entities who have access to capital and funds that are available for you. The two methods that we actually use are um, either we provide programs, and I'll talk about our partnership with um, Dartmouth where the Tuck School of Business and WeBank do a development program that tries to assist in scaling business. And so we have scholarships available for people to attend that and literally all of your expenses, in, including the tuition, are paid for so that you have the opportunity. So I myself used to work for Pfizer, the pharmaceutical company, and when I would go to anything that would train, develop, or assist me in growing my part of Pfizer's business, that was something that I didn't have to do anything other than show up for, right? Well, as we all know, for small business and for, for entrepreneurism, um, that is all coming out of your pocket. It's the expenses and it's your time away from your business. And so what we try to do is make sure that we're offering the programs and the funding along with that so that you can attend something like the Tuck We Bank program, uh, which IBM is a very large sponsor of. And with that, those, those items are paid for, they help you to scale your business. So you need to market differently, you need to manage differently, and you definitely need to understand your finances. And so one of our large focuses is around training to make sure that you can run the business in a different way and you know what you have access to. So that's one of the, the main ways that we do it. Our second main way of ensuring that resources are available to you is through our corporate partnerships where we have corporations and many of these are in the banking industry um, and people are very, um, our members are very excited about providing opportunities to you that they can look at your business plan, that we can develop those business plans for investment purposes. Obviously, we want you to get some investment and some capital in infusion, but we do want you to remain a certifiable business. So we're always looking for avenues that can infuse cash into your business, but not take away your ownership in that model. And so ours is really about training developing and providing access so that you can find all the channels that are actually out there for the capital that's available to you. Great. Uh, Sharon, I was really struck by the inclusion of the words diversity and particularly innovation in your mission statement with connecting um, opportunities with your uh, with suppliers. So could you elaborate upon that and talk about specific uh, programs or resources that you have available? Sure, thank you. I believe innovation was inserted into the overall description because we have to think differently mm -hmm. about how we do business. Um, I was just talking about this uh, earlier this morning. Our organization is 45 years old, and it was created um, by executive order by Richard Nixon on the heels of the civil unrest. And so if you think 45 years ago and the need of having um, accountability, in my particular case of the private sector, um, while there is still that identifiable um, need in terms of disparity in the marketplace, we look at businesses a little bit different or the way of doing business a little bit different in that we can apply those same practices that were created 45 years ago today. And so as we look also at the level of businesses that we've been able to serve um, recently, um, we have to come up with innovative types of solutions by which we help them to grow, and hence why there was uh, certification. We're a sister organization to what Pam does, and so a lot of what she's described is what we do as well. Um, we, d we are a premier organization in terms of certifying minority businesses um, across the country. My affiliate is one of 23 affiliates from across the country. But I tell people that certification is the license to hunt. And what we do is our job is to then provide the fertile ground by which you hunt. And that is building the relationship between our members, which is the corporate sector, and our minority businesses. So that's, that's our job, is to build that bridge between those two entities. And so we, we do it in a number of ways. 
Um, we find ways by which we make those direct connections because at the end of the day, business is about relationships and turning those relationships into revenue. So how do you do that? We try to do things like matchmakers, where we look directly at who's buying in the organization, but more importantly, what are you buying over the, the next, um, in, in our case, we do the next 18 to 36 months, so that the conversation is around um, opportunities, because that's what minority businesses want. They want the ability to, um, to, nobody's asking for a handout, they want the ability to play in the game in terms of going after opportunities, and so that's what we do. We do a number of things, like as Pam was describing, we have an executive education program as well, whereas um, through Tuck or whether it's Kellogg University at Northwestern, um, Kellogg, um, at Northwestern University, uh, providing MBEs with the ability to, um, to um, in, infuse, that, infuse that knowledge within themselves, because you know, oftentimes entrepreneurs don't have time to make that investment in themselves. So we provide that opportunity um, as well in order to make that happen. And then we come up with um, things like we have an MBE Academy, which takes a deeper dive into business. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's a 16, um, 16 um, CEOs of MBEs go through a, a um, 24 week program where we do a deeper dive into their finances, um, their marketing strategy, and come up with a plan in terms of helping them grow. And so our job, again, is to, for our members to recruit those competitively viable minority businesses to do business with them, and then for our minority businesses to provide them with the opportunity for, um, for opportunities with our private sector members, and in our particular case, because we sit at the biggest seat of government, infused within our organization, we also have the federal government, state and local, um, but to provide those opportunities as well. And then we, you know, try to have a little bit of fun with it. Um, I created this thing called Get on the Bus, where when I looked at our, our region, um, I was actually traveling to one of our MBEs one day, and in this traffic, if you're in this, if you're in this DMB, you know how challenging that could be. And I said to myself as I was going through Virginia and passing some of our corporate members, which include like the Hilton and Northrop and Lockheed and others, like wouldn't it be great to get on a bus mm -hmm. to come see these folks? And so I created this program, Get on the Bus, and the first one we did was in the, the um, area of Prince George's County, and we, we um, had the county executive on the bus with us, and he showed us where um, his vision was around opportunities in that, um, in that county. And the next year, we introduced Get on the Plane, whereas we then took some MBEs to another council because at the end of the day, we want to be able to also facilitate growth between minority businesses. And so that MBE to MBE network piece is valuable as well. And so those are some of the kind of innovation, innovative types of solutions that we try to apply to a problem that still exists today. Mm -hmm. And until we recognize that we have to come, we have to apply different types of solutions, we will continue to have the same conversation. Great. Maureen, as you know, we have shared goals um, in terms of increasing entrepreneurship and ownership within the broadcast and telecommunication industries. So tell us about um, minority telecommunications development. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. Let me just say that um, because I'm in the domestic policy office, I have the opportunity to reach a lot of the policymakers, both within um, our agency, more broadly in commerce, and then more broadly throughout governments and in and, and the public and private sectors. And so I've had an opportunity to work with many of the people on this panel today. Um, so I really see my role more as a connector and a facilitator. Because we don't currently have any ongoing grant opportunities, and some of you may remember the Recovery Act program, mm -hmm. the um, Broadband Technology Opportunity Grant Program, which enabled private companies to apply for grants in order to deploy broadband as well as to develop public computing centers or to develop programs that, associate, that, that assisted 
folks in learning how to use broadband. Currently, we're, we don't have those kinds of opportunities, but because the administration is very focused now on infrastructure, one of the roles that I'm trying to help play is identifying opportunities um, in terms of the policy making that help ensure that there are opportunities and roles for small and minority businesses to play. So as an example, and I'd like to take a moment to introduce my colleague, uh, Lejeune Dismutes, who is the OSTABU, the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization Director at the Commerce Department. You all may be aware of the FirstNet um, public safety sure. broadband network that is being built by AT&T um, in partnership with the U.S. Commerce Department. And Lejeune and I just a few weeks ago held a big matchmaking opportunity for minority and small businesses with AT&T and several of its Peer One contractors in order to identify sub um, lower tier subcontracting opportunities. Mm -hmm. This is a 25 billion, I mean, excuse me, 25 year contract that's um, capped at over $100 billion. And so we're looking at a very long term opportunity that will help small businesses, if they get their foot in the door, to grow. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I want to talk a little bit more about are, you know, the federal government as a client, a customer, because getting business um, experience supporting the federal government is a great way to establish yourself and to demonstrate your bona fides as a small business. I mean, what better reference could you have than the federal government? Then, of course, um, and, and you know we can be a tough customer, <laughs> but um, I'm going to also talk just a moment about NTIA has a federal laboratory uh, out in Boulder, Colorado. It's the Institute of Telecommunication Sciences. What many people don't know is that there are opportunities for private companies to partner through cooperative um, research and development agreements in order to begin to test and to do cutting edge research that can then be commercialized. And so um, CRADA's cooperative research agreements are one of the most effective methods of technology transfer. Mm -hmm. And it's a very good way um, for small businesses to get access to cutting edge researchers, equipment, opportunities to learn about new and innovative technologies in order to bring them to the marketplace. Um, and then more broadly, the Commerce Department consists of 12 bureaus. Um, and I'll just le read them very quickly because you will see, based just on the titles of the bureaus, the diversity of the kinds of procurements that Commerce undertakes. Um, Bureau of Economic Analysis, the Bureau of Industry and Security, the U.S. Census Bureau. We've got a decennial census coming up, and so there are great opportunities there. Um, the Economic Development Administration, the International Trade Administration, the Minority Business Development Agency, which you've heard about, and this is the only federal agency dedicated to the promotion and growth of minority businesses, in part through its network of small business and uh, minority business centers. The National Institute of Standards and Technology. NIST is a, has um, amazing award-winning, Nobel Prize winning scientists that are conducting research that is being made broadly available to the marketplace. So you may have heard about the cybersecurity framework. This is data that's readily available on our website, but provides some basis for small businesses that are interested in um, cybersecurity as an example. NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association, our weather service. Um, the National Technical and Information Service. It is a bureau within commerce that makes available cutting edge um, research, government funded technical information, and this is all, you can learn about all the uh, commerce bureaus on our website at commerce.gov. Finally, um, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Everybody needs to protect their intellectual property, and so there are a whole host of resources that are available through each of the bureaus. Many of them um, do much more contracting than um, NTIA, which is a small bureau, which is focused on providing advice to the administration around internet telecommunications policy. So I will stop there, but I did want to um, make sure that I um, gave a shout out to um, our uh, colleagues at um, USPTO because they did host a very 
effective matchmaking opportunity with AT&T, and we want to continue to partner with private industry, other bureaus, in order to more widely disseminate information about opportunities as they become available. One last thing that I will say is that on a resource table, we have provided a list of upcoming commerce opportunities um, so that you can get a sense of what's available. They're um, segmented by NAICS code and bureau with a point of contact. So anybody who is interested in active opportunities, please make sure you take a look at the resource table. Great, thank you. So mm -hmm. just a point of clarification, mm -hmm. if I'm a uh, supplier, I'm interested in any of those bureaus, would I be contacting them separately or do you have a one portal or one gateway? And that would be? And that would, and okay, that would be great. Office of Small and Disadvantaged Office of Small and, okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Susan, thank you for being here. Um, you, uh, your name has been raised uh, and you've been praised uh, by our previous panels for the work that, you, that you've done with the Pan-Asian American Chamber of Commerce as well as your work across boundaries with other chambers and other organizations. So welcome and tell us what uh, your organization, the resources that you have available through your organization. Sure. Um, in 1963, it was uh, President Nixon that uh, decided that um, the federal government has a role to play in encouraging more minorities in the federal contracting. That was after the Philadelphia plan that he's established. And therefore, the MBDA was formed in 1963. I was in Hong Kong still going to school at that time. <laughs> um, and many things have happened. We're now living in a very interconnected world. For global trade, your first question to Pam was about the global economic uh, uh, growth. And whatever we do here, because of the advent of internet and telecommunication and all that, um, what we do here has implications globally. Um, we at USPAC uh, does exactly what we bank and the National Minority Development Supply Development Council uh, do, except that we have, we started 33 years ago as a niche, because we found that at that time nobody would pay attention to the fastest growing population in the United States. Asian Americans. Many of us thought of us as we have good curry, we have good kimchi, we're boat people, we clean people's laundry, and I thought that there, that's, there's another image of us. So we were formed in 1984, and fast forward to today, we do a lot. We certified Asian American businesses and other minority businesses as well, if they ask us to. But we concentrate on the Asian Americans, because as immigration, the door of legal immigration continues to open, there will be Asian Americans coming across the Pacific Ocean to come here for further study, to invest, and to live um, their retirement. So we have a very vibrant and very rich culture and rich population to surface. Many of them still have to get acclimated to the American way of life. So in the last uh, 33 years, we've grown a lot. No, we do not take any government funding. Everything we do is from the private sector, from the corporation, and from our Asian American members. I can tell you that our Asian American members are even more generous than a corporation who write big checks for us because they find value in what we do for them. For us at USPAC, customer is king. Our member is king, and we have two, three categories of members. Asian American and other minorities are our clients. <coughs> Unlike, this is how we distinguish ourselves from NMCC and WeBank. Our member, our, our client is not the corporate sector, although they are a very important partner within our organization's membership because without them, our members will not succeed. But we focus on developing, growing, nurturing, and educating our Pan-Asian American members. Um, our stock in trade is relationship building. You heard about today. I am like my mother. I love to socialize. Getting the, to get into the network is like home shopping for me. <laughs> I play it. People play golf. They play chess. It's home shopping. I go wherever I go. And Nina said 70% of success is showing up. I show up 85 or more percent. I carry my office with me wherever I go. Uh, in relationship building, in 1999, uh, we brought to the market our signature program called the one-on-one -on -one pre-scheduled business matchmaking meeting. 
Nobody thought about it. We did it. Corporation loved it. The SBA, then the SBA administrator, Hector Barreto, loved it and took it into the SBA, partnered with HP and, and electron, uh, uh, automated it. But we still did that for a long time uh, manually because we really think that automation does not give the customized service to matching our businesses with the corporation for the unique need. So we did that. Um, we also have, in the last few years, uh, started our Chief Procurement Officers Forum, where we brought uh, the Chief Procurement Officers of Fortune 500 companies, 1,000 companies, come and tell us, tell our member, what was in their mind, what are, where are they going in terms of procurement, the policies and practices, what's, what's it that they are, they, they, the directives they are giving to their procurement uh, supply chain management folks. So our members actually learn from the high, up, highest level of policy and uh, decision-making level at corporate America. And um, uh, seven years ago, uh, that's what we did. Uh, so 15 years ago, we started our one-on-one pre-scheduled -pre matchmaking meeting. Seven years ago, we started our Chief Procurement Officers Forum. Three years ago, we knew that technology is driving us crazy, driving the way we live, we work, we communicate, we play. So we started our Chief Technology Officers and Chief Information Officers Forum, which is a standing room only type of audience during our, our meetings. Um, and they are the one who always, the Chief Procurement Officers and Chief Technology and Chief Information Officers, and now the Chief Financial Officers are looking forward to coming to our conference because they know that meet some of the best and brightest among Asian Americans, and we also attract other minority businesses too. And that gives us a, a, a platform to reach out even further. Um, we have our Supply Diversity Managers Caucus. Uh, it is in our 15th year also, where we bring the manager, directors, and uh, vice presidents of the uh, folks in corporation who are in charge of, responsible for making sure uh, the corporation's procurement team do look at the diverse uh, minority and women-owned businesses with a serious attention, uh, seriousness so that they are not just passing by and giving us a business card and showing us their PowerPoint, but the conversation go, would go deeper than that. Um, in our 15th year, it's still very popular. Uh, we have been told that this is uh, one of the best events that they, they would attend, uh, where the, the rookies in supply diversity uh, managers will meet with the deans, the PhDs in supply diversity management. Uh, we are very, very proud of what we've done. And those are the creative, innovative programs we keep on improving. Um, we also have a Business Express, which is, uh, in other words, a, um, a uh, similar to some other program where you bring the businesses together and teach them things that they, or let them share, uh, CEOs of uh, Asian American owned companies and other minority owned companies, CEOs who would have all this problem that is burning in their mind, but they do not have anywhere to share. They'll come together and begin to share the problems that they, they would be learn that, wow, what has been burning me, you have it too, and it's not that difficult, and they, sh they help to solve each other's problem, which is very gratifying to see them come back to say, Susan, so, so glad that you bug us, or your team bug us, and tell us we should be here. Um, we also have our uh, CEO Academy, where we uh, provide personalized uh, uh, coaching for those who understand that they have to change, otherwise things will change them help them uh, handle uh, uh, their personal way of uh, either adapting to the corporate culture in doing business with major corporation or handling their internal personnel and financial issues. Uh, these are uh, uh, what we call change management. Uh, at our conference last, uh, last week, we had a very, very successful uh, session uh, for our CEOs who joined the academy. Uh, 10 months in a year, we will, every Twice a month, we will have a nationwide or worldwide webinar where we will teach uh, for an one hour. We will have folks come on onto the webinar and share their own experiences from uh, whether uh, running a business as a family-owned business is an advantage or a disadvantage to how to grow from a $60 million company to $100 million or and beyond. Um, we do a lot. And uh, we also have great partnership with all the Osterbuhl directors in all the federal agencies. Uh, I came to uh, Washington, D.C. from high school as a young punk. Uh, 
and therefore I grew up in the cradle of Washington, D.C. politics, policies, and government contracts. I understand it. I know the SBA. I know the MBDA. I practiced law for a while. God had a different path for me and got me into this job, and I've been the happiest woman ever since. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So, Major, uh, when we think of the Small Business Administration, we think of uh, Section 8A, microloans, uh, small business centers, but there, uh, uh, there's a myriad of ways that the SBA supports small businesses. So tell us about the Office of Advocacy. Before I do that, let me just, uh, I was listening to the other presentations, and uh, I, I know that uh, <clears throat> Congressman Mitchell is probably in heaven, and he's smiling right now. And he's smiling because uh, one of the things that uh, we wanted to do early on back in the 80s was to get organizations like Susan's organization and Sharon's and Pamela's organizations uh, not necessarily together, but recognizing that there was enough work out there for everyone to do uh, and not necessarily be at odds with each other. And it was just great to hear <clears throat> the uh, conversations from each of you uh, in terms of the areas that you're working in uh, and the top-notch work that you're doing. And that was something that was, uh, that was missing uh, back in the 80s and is, you know, most of the folks here are so young they don't, you know, remember all that stuff. But uh, we, were, um, we were throwing fire bombs. We, can, we can't really say it now because security and all that, but we were... Uh, <laughs> actually throwing fire bombs without any fire in it, but just uh, trying to get the government, both private sector as well uh, with the M Minority Supply Development Council, uh, as well as the public sector to recognize the importance uh, of small and minority business, and that included uh, African-American business, women-owned business, Asian businesses, and in fact, uh, Susan and uh, Paul of Parents uh, Brain Trust, uh, we had some very uh, strong uh, Asian-American businesses uh, that, uh, that, that we work with. So uh, for me, I was, for me, it was listening to that and I was enjoying that. So uh, I just want to uh, wish you continued success in terms of the things that you're doing because there's still a lot to be done. All right, so the Office of Advocacy, as I said earlier, uh, is independent of, of SBA. We were created in the late 1970s by Congress. Uh, some tell, tell me that Congress just didn't feel that SBA was doing what it needed to do, so it created this, this entity called the Office of Advocacy. And uh, it, we were given broad powers uh, to, to actually uh, represent the interests of small business uh, before federal agencies, but some of that power also included representing uh, small businesses uh, and minority businesses in, uh, uh, in, in the private sector. Uh, Office of Advocacy over a period of time has, has morphed into uh, a structure uh, created prim primarily by Congress in which uh, one of our primary roles is to, uh, uh, to look at federal regulations and to, to be the voice of small business uh, as those federal regulations are being uh, pushed forward. And uh, last year we saved small businesses about $7 billion uh, in federal regulations that uh, they would've, you would have had to comply with uh, if, if we were not there advocating uh, on your behalf. And that number uh, goes up, it goes down, uh, but for the most part, uh, we are considered by the federal agencies as being the entity to go to to see whether or not their regulations are complying uh, with uh, the federal requirements for small business. So that's the one thing that we, we, we primarily do. On the, uh, on the other side of that equation, um, uh, one of the things that I have been doing since the early 1980s has been uh, involved in the federal procurement process. Uh, I'm probably one of the few people who actually uh, can read the far at night as a bedtime story. Uh, one of prob <laughs> probably one of the few people who understand, <laughs> who understand what the far is really saying. But, uh, you know, I, I cut my teeth in Congress on federal procurement, and I, I think that becomes one of the, that becomes the essence uh, of, of a large uh, percentage of what 
uh, what we need to do in terms of helping uh, small businesses, minority businesses uh, grow in that marketplace. Um, and uh, so I, I, I follow uh, most of the federal procurement uh, uh, regulations and I make comments and I try to ensure that uh, small businesses are uh, protected uh, in those regulations. But at the same time, uh, that, that also uh, carries over uh, responsibility and looking at various uh, programs that are coming out of the federal government and trying to ensure that small businesses are actually participating in those programs. Now, uh, I won't cry, but uh, Maureen and I just had a, a conversation uh, a few moments before the program started about, uh, she mentioned the BTOP, and that was, uh, that was an effort that, uh, and I have to say that she was a trooper because there are a lot of folks who did not want uh, that process to go forward, but we were determined, there was a determination that small businesses needed to participate in that program. And uh, one way that we were able to do that was to, um, Maureen was able to get, convince her leadership that the SBA size standard needed to be changed to be increased so that a, a larger number of small businesses could participate in that uh, grant program. And uh, that was done, mm -hmm. and we worked through SBA and others to make sure uh, that happened. So. Uh, a lot of what I do is, is, is actually working, trying to work with the various agencies. Uh, we mentioned commerce and, um, you know, um, sometimes I hate coming out to these sessions because I actually learn the real truth of what, what has happened. Uh, we talked about uh, FirstNet and uh, I had a group of small businesses, very small, that came to me and said, this, the commerce is getting ready to do this thing that they call FirstNet, and uh, we want to participate. And how do we participate? And we uh, attempted to, uh, to, to pull the onion skin back uh, on this thing, and it was a convoluted onion, okay, to say the least. Uh, it was a convoluted onion that had been actually created by Congress and we were not uh, successful in getting small businesses at the table before the contract was awarded, and that was our particular goal. Uh, I do understand, and I think, you know, there's not all is lost because there are now conversations regarding subcontracting opportunities and, and so forth, and hopefully those opportunities do materialize, but uh, we were looking at getting, trying to get small businesses at the table to be part of the actual development process so, uh, so that they were not necessarily getting subcontracts that were indirect contracts to the whole development process. And, and I think that's, you know, Sharon talked about innovation. I think that's where all of this has to go in terms of, in terms of opportunities for small business. Um, Maureen mentioned NIST. Well, I've been involved with NIST for a number of years in terms of cybersecurity and trying to get small businesses involved in cybersecurity, not only from a protection standpoint, but from the development standpoint of, of product and services uh, so, that that, uh, so that they can participate in that market. And that market is, is <clears throat> the dollar signs on that market is just, just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we have to be there at the start of the process, otherwise we, 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 we get what's left at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what we do in the Office of Advocacy. We're a small office. Uh, we're a small office of about 52, uh, 52 uh, our employees nationwide. Uh, but we advocate uh, for and on behalf of, of you as small business owners uh, in those areas. So. You know, sometimes it's regulation, sometimes it's, sometimes it's procurement, sometimes it's policy changes, uh, sometimes it's just getting a face in the place to let them know that there are small businesses out there. But uh, for us, we have to have you come to us and tell us what you're looking for so that we can work together uh, to do that. Uh, 
There's a lot of, I mean, opportunities. Uh, we talk, talked about cybersecurity. When the other area I'm working in uh, is international trade. And I know, you know, you read the paper and you don't know whether we're going to have a NAFTA or not going to have a NAFTA and all that. But I will tell you that that market uh, is not going to go away, okay? Regardless of what the trade agreement may look like, there is a tremendous market out there for small and minority businesses, and we have to be at the door when that door opens. Uh, because if we're not, we're going to get we're going to get pushed to the side. And uh, you know, we're already having some discussions with the EU in terms of a um, in terms of some type of agreement, whether it's a trade agreement or not. But uh, there will be a flow of opportunity. And we got to make sure that, that, that we're at, in that flow and getting positive results from it. So that's kind of what, what I do in the Office of Advocacy. And uh, to date, no one has told me to stop doing what I'm going to do. <laughs> so, so you're going to keep on. I will keep doing okay. it until uh, someone tells me to stop. Great. Uh, in the time we have left, I'd just like, um, and I'll throw this out for anyone to address, what do you see is the biggest challenge or obstacle currently for small and diverse businesses? And what resources or strategies do you have or know of that can help overcome them? Anybody want to start? Susan? Susan? Yes. <laughs> well, uh, it's a perennial problem for small businesses. Uh, I heard earlier today, uh, Act One's uh, spokesperson said that uh, even with a multi-billion dollar company, when put side by side with a larger corporation, uh, they would be told that, well, but you're not big enough, yeah. although you're multi-billion. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine, folks who are represented here, what they will be have been he hearing? They are not big enough. Mm -hmm. I testified before the Senate Small Business Committee some years ago when uh, Senator Landrieu was um, the chairman. And I, she asked for some uh, um, things to talk about. <laughs> I think she only asked for three and gave us eight. And at the end, she said, Susan, would you just give me three so I can, I can deal with? Uh, one of the, that was uh, exactly this. Corporation in, for, uh, for efficiency, consolidation, whatever you call it, rationality. Uh, vendor rationalization, they are contracting the number of suppliers they use from a large number to a smaller number, so they could, they could manage it. We call it, years ago, uh, contract bundling. And I had testified before a general services commit administration about that. And my husband said, Susan, don't fight the battle, it's a losing battle. And I said, husband, but it cannot, it doesn't have to be this way. Well, I think it's changing a little bit. That's a major challenge, um, Carolyn. Uh, how do we make sure that small business like those who are represented here and many of our majority of, of our respective members could have a seat at the table, at least to listen to, the, to, to, to learn and somewhere, somehow get there? Uh, my members will be told that, you know, I know what's in a con federal contractor's uh, program manager's mind, if you fail, Prince, it's on my job. If IBM fail, it's IBM, it's okay. That's not okay for my constituency. That's not okay for a small business because IBM will not be there except for members like ours who buy their products. Mm -hmm. That's a major. And um, I don't think politicians know how to handle it. Uh, they ask us to, to partner, to team. Uh, yes, we try our best. You know, sometimes teaming is like a marriage. It's very difficult to get to like each other, to know each other, and share everything together. And it's, until you are in, in business, it's hard. I think Nina Vakas, uh, who was a speaker earlier today, has a good, uh, has a good, good start. And, uh, but if you talk to uh, Janice Howrat, how, how, uh, she would say that even for her, as a multi-billion dollar company, we have that problem. So, if there is uh, some magic wand and some magic formula, I'd like to hear it. <laughs> Anybody else want to address that? I wanted to mention the fact that it seems that small businesses are often behind the curve in terms of learning about opportunities. And so part of what is important 
are for small and minority businesses to come to events like this, to go to trade shows, to engage with the policy makers who are addressing issues of concern to you because through those relationships you get some early warning sometimes about what's coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. And when um, Major was talking about the Office of Advocacy and its role with regard to regulations, well there is a new um, sort of paradigm that the Commerce Department has adopted. It's called multi-stakeholder engagement, where we are trying to develop um, through non-regulatory processes some best practices around certain topics. And it's really, really important for small and minority businesses to engage in this kind of policy discussion because these um, lead to the rules of the road mm -hmm. that become adopted as you know industry best practice and so while it's not regulatory which would then mean that you know um, majors office of advocacy would not necessarily be engaged it's really important and certainly at the commission you know how important it is to have a record Absolutely. that includes the views of small and minority businesses in some of the very important topics that are under, under discussion here. So I would really encourage folks, I understand that you're focused on doing your business, mm -hmm. but you've got to be able to look a little beyond. You know, look into the horizon, and policy is one way, and those policy discussions are one way to give you sort of an early warning around those topics that are emerging and are likely going to either result in some regulation or some sort of um, industry accepted practice. So I would really encourage people to think strong and hard about how to do that. And certainly um, OCBO is very good about sending out alerts regarding upcoming um, FCC proceedings that may have an impact on you. But all of the federal agencies have um, RSS feeds where if you have a particular area of interest, you can get information about what's coming down the pike. And also, you that's where you would find information on the multi-stakeholder uh, yes. proceedings as absolutely, well? Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's on our website. Thank Great. you. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, I'd follow in on what Maureen said. You know, if you sit and you say, what are the problems that are faced? What's the worst problem? We could all sit here and we would all tell you the same ones, starting with access to capital. Mm -hmm. But the approach that I would advise each and every one of you to take, I at one point was an independent business owner myself. It was a very successful business. I've worked in corporate America, and now I run a nonprofit organization solely for the purpose of bringing those entities together. Um, so I have a pretty unique position, and my viewpoint is, is don't focus on the problem, focus on being part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And the solutions that are in front of you just sitting here in this room include your Ozdebu counterparts who really are working to bring those opportunities to the forefront for each and every one of us. Um, in addition to that, we have an SBA. There's a lot of a lot of countries that don't have access to that. We have an SBA, there's a lot of um, of opportunity available uh, for many of the barriers that exist, especially when you're definitely at the bottom of small business or starting a business. And the best thing I think that we have here in, in the Americas that don't, does not always exist everywhere are the organizations that, that we represent up here, which is we're purposefully existing because corporate America and in our case, uh, the federal government, we are certifier for the women owned small business set, about, set aside, WSB. And so through both the government entities as well as the, um, the private sector, you have the ability to come to our organizations um, to, to be part of solution building, right? Whether that's to meet through the matchmaking that you heard us talk about or to attend educational summits and, and training courses that will help you to build the strategies to grow your business or, or whether it's any other number of things that we do in order to break down those barriers take advantage of those, again, whether it's um, based on ethnicity, sex, gender, whatever those things are, make sure that you take advantage of that. There's industry councils as well. Whatever that is that is best for you, take advantage of it. Um, many of us are collaborating together, so we're looking for the best opportunities across organizations. So yes, we can spend a lot of time talking about the problems and really focus on that problem, but you have access to organizations that can help you with solutions. Mm -hmm. Great. I think uh, I totally agree with my colleagues. I think the only thing I would add is to look for the opportunity. Let me tell you what I mean by that. 
I, I think that there's a level of sophistication around a lot of entrepreneurs, if we look over the decades. Um, and we're even having to look at how deals are structured um, in terms of um, acquisitions uh, and things of that nature. The problem that we're faced with oftentimes is the categories of our minority businesses, where they tend to be in certain categories or industries. Um, and the thing that I would like to see happen is that some of these businesses are ideal position, ideally positioned to pivot to be able to um, take advantage of the future. And so as we look at emerging types of technologies, and whereas as minority businesses we've been shut out in the past, mm -hmm. there is the, there may be, or should be, or we should work toward the opportunity to have the seat at the table um, in terms of these emerging types of technology. So as they grow, our businesses will grow in the future as well. Great. Well, the, go ahead. Well, I think so. Uh, the reason I posed that problem was you asked what, what, what are the problems. The biggest of course, problem. we're here to <coughs> find solutions so mm -hmm. we can work together. And the fact that we are all seated at the table here and at USPAC, we have been for many years reached out to the African American, Hispanic, uh, gay and lesbian and women organization to do that. I think it's high time for us to do more. I'm glad that we have this podium, this forum to further expand that thought. And um, I think with uh, Commissioner Pai, uh, who revamped uh, the, the advisory committee, I uh, had a little talk with him a couple of times in, in, in recent weeks. Uh, it will go further, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if we take, really take, uh, Heather, this, uh, this meeting that you have engineered so well together with Rudy, I think we can, uh, using the federal government, or the federal FCC as a, as a model, uh, as a prototype, can jump start it. But I also want to say that um, my experience working with the federal government, they have been the most cooperative uh, because they're mandated by law. Okay, they have, uh, they have the law uh, above their head and maybe it is uh, not always a maximum, maximum practicability, but still they have that. But in the private sector, it's much less than that. It's more of a market-driven mm -hmm. um, uh, initiative, but I must say that for the corporations who are within our membership, we gratify that our corporate members have been very, very uh, uh, accommodating if uh, on the one end and very, uh, 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 enthusiastic in seeking mm -hmm. diverse suppliers uh, through us uh, because they know that at USPAC uh, we have a unique brand brand for them to look at. So um, please do not take what uh, my answer to your question as a negative or an, a problem. It is a problem that is staring us in our face. We have to deal with it. Perhaps uh, uh, a major with your help with the office of advocacy, I can uh, pick your brain again and see what we can do some more. I know that it is a big Barracuda in the middle of the ocean, we're gonna turn that, and I think we turn some corners. Uh, with this ex forever ex uh, increasing and expanding community of uh, women and, and uh, diverse business community, we can do better, and I think uh, we should do better, and we will do better. Would you like so, final, with some final, <laughs> final, uh, words. final, final words. Let in me, the time um, we have left, and, brief and final I hope remarks. this doesn't create any um, controversy. Uh, but if it does, uh, I think out of controversy, there's also uh, progress. Um, I think there are a couple things that, that, that are operating uh, as I see it, and I have seen it over the period of time. And I think one, one of the biggest problems is that uh, as small business owners, and I'm speaking to all those of you out there who are small business owners, and I've been in that arena as well, uh, we have to join organizations that are going to help us move our goal and objective. I mean, we, we, can't, we cannot sit on the sideline and let the U.S. Pan uh, Asian American Conference just do whatever it's doing. We got to be part of that organization. We, we have to be part of the National Minority Supply Development Council and PAMS group. So <clears throat> too, many, too many times small businesses come to me and they don't even know these organizations exist. 
okay? Uh, they can tell you about the larger, larger, mm -hmm. super larger organizations that's out there, and most of those organizations are taking their membership money and not providing them with service. So, from, so small businesses have to become engaged, and uh, that, that requires some effort, okay? It requires some effort but it is a necessary effort if we are really serious about moving this ball further. Now, for the service organizations, <clears throat> what I would like, to, if you ask me what I would like to see, Susan says she wants to pick my brain, I would like to see you be more active in the congressional process, okay? Because there is so, even though we talk about the, the government contracting process and so forth, there is a lot of bills that are going through Congress that are private sector bills that actually impact small businesses. And that, the, the many members of Congress, many members of the, the, those committees are not getting the input from organizations like your organizations as to that. And Susan mentioned uh, uh, Senator Landrieu and you know, some of these members actually have reached out to a lot of the organizations, but a lot of them don't know these that you exist. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a lot of information that you can, can actually get. Actually, you can get a lot of information from our website at Advocacy that you can actually send back out to your members. And it's free information because we put on there proposed regulations that are coming from agencies. If there is a request by an agency for a public hearing as this, we put that out there. So that information we're putting out and you're welcome to take that information and send it back to your members. But you gotta give your members more and, and, and get them more engaged, and the members themselves have to become more engaged. And it's we, a, so it's a two-way street. Yeah, we thank you for that. We're gonna move swiftly in, in the interest of time, maybe 30 seconds to give your final <coughs> thoughts. Go ahead, Susan. My final thought will be uh, amen. <laughs> uh, USPAC has two parallel institutions, the USPAC Education Foundation, which is a 501c3 organization that does not lobby, that we provide education training and networking opportunities, which is what we do 90% of our time. And we have another organization, which is US Pet Advocacy, which is a 501c3 advocacy organization. That's where I talk about bundling. I go to Congress and testify before small business committees on both the House and Senate, and actually uh, write lobbying letters. So yes, indeed, we do do that. Uh, I know that some of the organization here are not in those categories because they are prohibited by their uh, tax exam status. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I, I think you have a 5% chance of doing that out of the money that the activities that you do. But if you, uh, uh, I'll be happy to work with you until uh, such time when you will uh, de uh, define it necessary or appropriate to form a separate advocacy arm. But we will do, do that. Oh, I just wanted to make sure that people realize that the federal government has a wealth of free data that are available. Please check, you know, agency websites because you get both, um, you know, an, an, an aggregation of data that makes it easier for you to find, but also you have very specific um, scientific technical data that are available that can help you as you develop new products and services. This morning, in fact, I was running a little late to get here because I was um, a part of a listening conversation with Senator Ben Cardin on this topic. And it was interesting to hear um, some of the younger MBEs talk about some of their challenges. And what struck me is that it's the, um, the ones that we've talked about in terms of the access to capital. How do I find out about all those robust kinds of information? Um, I, I still, um, I think that um, we have what we call a business consortium, and that is the Capital Region Minority Supply Development Council plus our two other assets, which is the MBDA Center, Washington, D.C., and the Federal Procurement Center. And even though we keep expanding the resources, it's still a necessary evil in terms of the activity um, that's, that's meaningful for our businesses to grow. 
I think what will become kind of a disruptor or a pivotal point is the fact that's kind of staring us in the face and that the number of businesses in this country in terms of diversity will be steadily increasing and that will be impacted by our shifting demographics. And so I think that it's going to be an innovative approach by which we have to look in the future of how we continue to kind of solve this issue. Okay. Well, thank you very much, um, each of you, your participation on this panel. We find out that we can uh, go to school tuition-free. Uh, we can get on the bus or the plane. We can find out uh, our contracting opportunities with, through all the bureaus of uh, NTIA. We can lobby as well as share our problems uh, with the uh, U.S. Uh, Pan-Asian American Chamber of Commerce, and we have an advocate within the Small Business Administration. Thank each of we, I thank you, each of you, for your particip participation today. We're out of time. Um, I don't know if we want to have a minute or two for questions. If any, okay. Uh, because we have the one-on-one -on -one sessions that everybody's eagerly awaiting, so we want to move on to those. Thank you again. Thank you, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Carolyn, and, and all of the panelists. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jamila Best Johnson, and I serve currently as the designated federal officer of the Advisory Committee on Diversity and Digital Empowerment. I'm, I'm just awed by all of the information that we had today and all of the networking and all of the people who really needed to know each other, maybe getting to know each other by the end of the day. So on behalf of my boss, uh, Michelle Carey, who's the Bureau Chief of the Media Bureau, I just want to thank you all so very much and again to extend the appreciation of our FCC Chairman Ajit Pai for you all taking your time and participating. I think we did some good here today. Um, I think, as Sanford said, we probably need to move on. Uh, there are people who are waiting anxiously to try to make further networking connections. Uh, and so we're going to move on to our one-on-ones. And so I would ask if you do have an appointment. Jamela, I have one thing. Before. OK. If, if you do have an appointment, uh, that you would go over to the side of the room and see John. John, raise your hand. There you go. OK. You need to see John and check in. If you haven't checked in by a certain time, John may release your appointment because we do have people who would appreciate a walk-up opportunity. So I'm going to ask you to do that. So again, we thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I believe our deputy DFO for the advisory committee, Brenda Villanueva, is on the telephone. Brenda, are you there? Can you say good afternoon? Yes, thank you, Jamila. Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to briefly thank, uh, again, the panelists and the moderators for their insightful discussion. I understand we're running short on time, but I also want to thank our team, uh, the agency team, and then also our working group team for all their help for this event today. Great discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. I, in the rush of time, I certainly forgot to do that. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank all of the people uh, in the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, all of the staff persons from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, uh, the persons in the Media Bureau, uh, my boss Michelle Carey and Sarah Weitzel and Brendan Holland uh, and Allison Newmuth in uh, the Chairman's Office. And I'm not going to name names because I would forget someone, but this has really truly been uh, a team effort. And I certainly want to point out for a special commendation uh, Heather Gate of Connected Nation, who serves as the chairperson uh, of the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group and her partner, Rudy Brioche of Comcast. Um, they're just a dynamic duo, and so we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for them. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, don't worry, I'll be quick. Um, I had some jokes written out and some fun stuff to say. I was going to talk about my favorite movies, Black Panther and Wakanda and all the good stuff, but I'm going to skip that stuff and just say, Repeat the thanks that Jamila said. Um, I actually tried to endeavor to write down everyone's name who helped out because I thought it was important. I mean, these folks worked hard. I mean, hard. Last night, I was up late last night, and there were folks working on this stuff. I got an email from Sharon Stewart at like 10 o'clock last night working on this. So we really tried to do a good job. Uh, so I have, from the FCC, Andrea Brown, Michelle Hines, Sharon Stewart, Maura McGowan, Brittany Stevens, Steve Balderson, and Jeff Reardon back there. 
uh, Belford Lawson, John Macris at the table, Zara, Zara Gonzalez, uh, Brittany Gomes, Francesca Campione, uh, Jamila Cadre, Celeste McCray, Rebecca Lockhart, DeAndrea Wilson, Kayla Hernandez Alua, Mikkel Mora, Diane Coho, Janet Kelly, Shauna Wilkerson, Aaron Boyd, Sherry Dawson, Vanessa LeMay, John Finney, Christian Fiscunari, Brenda Villanueva on the phone, Lakeisha Brunson, Andrea Stewart, I talk fast, I'm from New York, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Jamila Best Johnson, Carolyn Fleming Wilson, Michelle Carey, M Matthew Berry, Chairman Pai, Sarah Whitesell, Allison Nemeth, our interpreters whose names I did not know, but thank you. And I hope I didn't forget anybody, but I really thought it was important to acknowledge those folks because they worked really hard to put this on, and I really appreciate them, so thank you. Great, thank you, ditto. Thanks to everyone. So as Chairman Pai started us, uh, us off this morning, we hope that you uh, will leave here today with con a concrete action plan that will lead to tangible results. And as Chairman Williams said, you can take your shot and as Tim Gunn says in Project uh, Runway, make it work. <laughs> Thank you.